Well, hi there, and thank you for joining us on a Falkirk TV Q and A. Uh, following some discussions with the, the board members towards the the end of the season, it was decided that the fans needed a, a little bit of clarity on the current goings on at the club. Uh, of course, in an ideal world, this would have taken place down at the stadium. Uh, we would have all been in. Amarillo or the Westfield Lounge, as we see at the, the AGMs and so on. Uh, of course, unfortunately, that's not really practical at this moment in time with the way the, the world is. Um, a little idea on the, the format of the questions. First and foremost, thank you to everyone who's who's joined me on this session. Uh, the, the questions are completely unfiltered. They have genuinely not had sight of them so far. Uh, so it's going to be as much as a, a surprise to them as it is to, to you watching this as well. Um, the only thing that we would have filtered in any way would have been the language, but I'm genuinely delighted to say that uh, everybody did keep it fairly civil, even the ones who were making a, a firm point, that's uh, fair enough. So thank you also to all the fans who've taken the time to submit all these questions. We've got ballpark round about 60 different questions that have been submitted. Uh, as you can imagine, we have various topics that are sort of hot topics at the moment. So some of the questions have been, been duplicated. After this session, I'm more than happy to, to give the, uh, the list just for complete transparency. If anybody does want that, please, by all means, get in touch. Um, to start things off, uh, you know, I appreciate some of these questions will be cutting, but uh, to start, they set the tone. First of all, Gary, can I go to yourself, Gary Deans? Um, why are we not live just now? Why are we not at the stadium doing this? Lewis, as you said in the introduction, and listen, but before we properly start with this, thank you for hosting this and thank you for um, collating all the questions and putting them across. Um, it's really appreciated by everybody, um, fans and boards alike. Um, so, um, as you said, it's difficult to be able to pull everybody together at the moment. It's not impossible because the restrictions are starting to lift. Um, it, but um, it, we, we had to make the decision um, a few weeks ago um, how we were going to be able to, to run uh, the Q&A that we, we'd said uh, to fans that we'd uh, promised that we'd, we'd be able to run. Um, so we had to have this by Zoom, unfortunately. Um, the next one will be live um, and we'll come on to that in due course um, uh, through the, uh, the, the, this evening's uh, Q&A. Um, one other good reason, um, is, is um, not a good reason, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, is Phil and Carrie um, were, were, um, it can't get to Falkirk. Um, it, so we're faced with a, 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 a position of um, either all of us not being uh, at a Q&A at the stadium um, or, or trying to hook up some massive video screen somewhere, which logistically we just couldn't do. Um, it, so we thought the compromise, and it is a compromise, and I apologise for the compromise, is um, a, a, a video um, a, or a Zoom um, a, with uh, the promise that we will be back in the stadium in front of people answering the questions as soon as we can possibly do so. To, uh, to perhaps set the tone, uh, we had uh, a few unhappy fans at the end of the, the season, as you can imagine, and uh, a question for yourself to begin things, and uh, not, a, not a particularly nice one, but it needs to be, to be asked. So we had contacts from Gary Hill and Tommy Logan, and they were saying under their leadership at the moment, Falkirk has sunk to a new low, in their opinion, the worst in 40 odd years. If you guys were imply, uh, employed in the private sector, you may no longer be here. Why was there not a, a resignation immediately after the Montrose game? I'll pause, but because it, 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 the private sector is a, is a good point. Um, I, um, I work in the private sector as well as being chairman of Falkirk, um, I, and you are assessing your performance. Our performance, collectively, um, I, um, hasn't been good enough. Um, I, you also take into account um, I, your own position, your own, um, I, um, you assess your own position, um, I, and you question whether you've still got things to be able to add. Um, I, um, and looking at what we were doing off the park, which we'll come on to in a minute, um, and putting us back into a position where we can rebuild the club and start building the club back up through the leagues um, a, was an important, certainly for me and for the board, and a, a, a decision-making process um, a, 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 and what we're looking at and what we're going to do, what we have done and what we will be doing next. Um, so, yeah, d d does everybody question um, a, whether they're doing the job that they should be doing and whether they're doing a good enough job? Absolutely. If you're not doing, questioning yourself and these kind of things, you shouldn't be there in the first place. It's part of the job to be able to assess yourself um, and collectively assess each other. Um, having said all that, um, the club had been, in my view, and it's a very personal view, on a decline for a number of years, not just over the last one, two um, that I've certainly been involved. 
um, and I'm not hiding behind um, a, a anything here, um, a, but it has been in decline for several years. You do not turn this quickly. Um, a, the, the, you need to put, put foundations in before you can get success off the field and on the field. Um, it, we feel that we're starting. To, we've put these foundations in. Unfortunately, they didn't. We didn't manage to build on them. We didn't manage to. Be, they didn't bear fruit for us um, a, at the end of last season. Um, but one of the things that did go through my mind was, if I stepped aside, is that going to improve the position of the club? And I don't believe it would. Um, now, that's not me being vainglorious and, and, and self-important, um, it, but me stepping aside, or for that matter, any of the other board me members, um, it, I don't think would make a big, a, a, a jot of difference um, a, um, positively in terms of taking this club forward. In fact, I think it would have the reverse effect. Um, it, I, I know we've got a very strong team throughout the club, and we're in the process of building on these foundations, putting in place um, great football people like Gary and, and Paul, who we'll hear from later on. So, yeah, it's right to ask the question. No problems in people asking the question. And it'll be up to the others to be able to judge that in due course as well, um, if whether we have actually collectively delivered or I've delivered. Um, it, we won't hide from that. Um, it, but at the moment, I don't think it is the right decision to step aside. So is it very much from your case then, from what you're saying, Gary, you still feel you have unfinished business at the club? I support this club I have done for 50 years. Um, I, um, I, I, I would... I would, if I thought I was an anchor on that on that that, that, that growth, um, I would stand aside. Um, it's, it's too important to me as, as a club, um, and, and without being too emotional about it, I want to see ourselves um, succeed collectively. Um, so I want the best people in place to be able to drive that that, that forward. Um, I, do I feel I can still do something here? Yeah, I do. Um, I, um, and if others don't. Um, it will let me know, and they have let me know um, uh, um, uh, through various channels and all the rest of it. That's fine. Um, people are entitled to their opinions. Um, uh, but I listen to my colleagues, I listen to the board members, I listen to those in the, in, in, in the, the stadium. Um, I think I can still add stuff um, uh, and still add value um, to the board and to the club. Um, uh, I'll, I'll continue to um, uh, appraise myself, and I would ask everybody else to be able to do the same. Before we go further, you mentioned a bit about work currently underway. Is there anything you can share with the fans now about the work that the board is doing in the background? Uh, uh, yeah, we can, and I'll, I'll do that right now. So it's a good, a, a good, a good um, uh, link to some some thoughts that we've got. Um, it, Phil um, uh, later on was going to cover this, but it's probably as well to, to cover this now. So Phil, do you want to cover off what we've done so far and possibly start well, building on what, what what we're going to be doing next? I'd, I'd be happy to, Gary. Um, Colin, I think you're the host. Do you mind just um, sharing the document that I've um, I've sent over to you? Um, and, and Lewis, I think whilst we've not had sight of the questions, I can I can support you in that at all. Um, it wouldn't take a rocket science rocket scientist to figure out that one of the questions that we were going to get um, was going to be what about what's the board doing? What have we been doing? And and let me start straight away by saying I think one of the things we haven't done is done a good enough job of communication. Um, and so let's let's start rectifying that straight away. And our commitment to you as fans is that we will continue to to communicate as transparently and openly as we can. But let's start with what we've done. And, and, and let me say, as this list comes up, this is what we've done in less than six months. This is all since January of this year. So I think um, as we go through it, it'll be um, I think you'll be quite impressed as to all the stuff that we have got on the way. And I said, again, apologies for not um, for not sharing this earlier. Colin, if you can, we'll start there and you can scroll down for me. That would be great. So first of all, we've expanded fan ownership by over 400,000 new shares, including attracting 19 new first-time investors, if you will, shareholders to the club. Um, we've been working with the Falkirk Support Society to appoint a fan representative to the board. We want to do that as soon as they're ready uh, and as soon as they're able to do so. We want a fan on the board. Uh, as we've always said, this is a three-legged model uh, and the fans are very much a part of that. Um, we've agreed and implemented a new football model, which we needed. And, and one of the things I would say is that I've been involved in professional football now for 21 years. I think it's fair to say that um, I'd never seen a club whose infrastructure had been so cut and cut back. The club was in a mess and that mess came home to roost, I think, at the end of last year. Um, but we're all paying for those for those fees, if you will. What we're doing and what we're focused on is rebuilding, building a stable uh, foundation, 
and building infrastructure that will allow us to take the club forwards. So we've agreed and implemented a new model. We developed a new five-year plan for the club, as you'd expect. We appointed a new sporting director uh, in Gary Holt to re-establish our infrastructure. And, and can I just say that, that, again, in my 21 years, I've never worked with anyone um, who's put so much time and effort into a job as Gary Holt has done. Uh, for the last six months, it's been 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And, and thank you, Gary, for everything you've done. Um, we've we've re-established or established a new uh, youth development program, um, which I'm delighted about. And thanks to Ian Fergus for all the work he's doing behind the scenes. We've already uh, trialed over 60 kids for that program. Uh, all of that has been done by word of mouth. It's likely, uh, please don't hold me to this, but it's likely that we'll have two new youth teams in the 21-22 season. Um, we've hired, as I said, in, in Ian Fergus, a very well-qualified and experienced development coach. We've appointed, appointed a full-time head of scouting recruitment. We've appointed a full-time head of sports performance. When Kerry and I came to the club and, and, and we looked at it, we didn't even have a scouting network. Um, so that is something we had to rectify. We've completed a thorough search and recruitment process for our head coach, uh, and we're delighted to have Paul on board. That was very extensive. We had well over 100 applicants um, and, took, and took a considerable amount of time on the board's part to get to the decision we made. And, and Paul was always our first choice um, and we're delighted to have him on board. Not only have we recruited Paul, we've also recruited a highly experienced goalkeeping coach in Tony Cage and an experienced assistant for Paul in Danny Granger. And we'd like to welcome both of those. We had no, again, we had no uh, means of profiling the players. So one of the things we put in place is a profiling system, which is based on uh, a 20 point profile for each position. We've, posi we've profiled all the current players in the squad, of course, talking about last season. Uh, and we've implemented that system, not only for profiling the current players, but also for recruitment and scouting of players coming in. We've invested in new data analysis software. Um, we've implemented a new player bonus structure. We've implemented a new highly incentivized player wage structure. Um, we've cleaned house on the 2021 squad, which is something we had to do. Um, and we've implemented, as we said, uh, that profiling system going forwards, which means that we have three options for every position uh, and we're scouting players a minimum of three times. Most of the players that Paul and Gary have brought in have been scouted at least seven times before they've been approached by the club. We've had initial meetings with at least three new investor groups. Uh, there'll be more on that later. We've invested in new IT infrastructure uh, and we're in the process of developing or working on developing a new club website, something we need uh, to, to support our communications. We had in the middle of uh, the winter to storm damaged floodlights, which we've had to replace. And, and thanks to, to Ronnie Bateman for all his hard work in getting that done, including damage to the roof. Uh, we're revamping our merchandise offerings uh, and you'll hear more about that as the call goes on. And we're outsourcing our online retail operations as well uh, to, a, to a highly reputable company there in Scotland. We've agreed contracts for a new shirt sponsor. We're in the process of recruiting a new general manager. There'll be more on that uh, as the, the weeks unfold and also recruit a new club ambassador to replace Alec Totten. We've kicked off a pitch review process and by no means, last but by no means least, we've prepared for the stadium for the return of fans, which has been a huge effort, which, which Ronnie has, has headed up for us. So thank you, Ronnie. I think you'll agree that that is quite an extensive list of, of, of achievements and things that we've done. One of the things we haven't done, and I apologise for, we, have, we haven't done a good enough job of communicating that to you, the fans. But our commitment to you going forwards is that we will keep you abreast of all those things. We'll keep you up to speed with and up to date with them. Um, but we've done a lot. And the important part of it is it's infrastructure. It's building blocks. It's things that will allow us to take this club forward for many years to come and not just in the short term. So, Lewis, I, I hope that helps you answer the question of what we've been doing. No, it, it absolutely does, Phil. First and foremost, thank you for that, because as a fan, there's a lot of things on that list that I wasn't aware of. And respectfully, I, I sometimes hear a few things that, that you know, most fans don't. But, you know, um, and I'm sure that kind of clarity is, is really appreciated. Um, one of the things I, I'd like to, to move on to talk about, especially with, with it being in the last week or so, is season tickets. We've, uh, you know, had a, around about a dozen different questions come in. And they're mainly split between the refund and reward side of things and the stadium access side of things. 
So uh, to, to begin with, I'd like to look at the, the refund and reward side. So uh, Ryan Didcock wrote in to say the club promised a thanks to the people who bought season tickets and added top ups and didn't take refunds from 2019-20. We haven't seen that yet. Instead, we've only seen price freezes and a few poor performances. Are the club going to action this promise and are they going to offer refunds for the games not fulfilled last season? I'll, I'll, take, I'll take that again, Lewis. Um, I, um, I, and listen, there's, there's a lot of apologising going on and we'll apologise again. Um, I, so we, we should have been in touch at the end of the uh, end of the season um, as to what the position was, but... Various things complicate it, but leave that to one side. Um, what are we doing and what have we done? We put out a statement um, saying that those that want refunds can have refunds. Um, it, in that statement, and I drafted that statement, so I take responsibility for that statement, and a lot of people have taken umbrage at, at elements of that statement, um, and I have no issue with that. Um, it, but let me explain why we put that statement together in the way that it was put together. Sure. Um, the, uh, as part of that, we, we calculated um, what the refunds would cost if everybody took the refunds, and compa compare that with the end of the, the previous season where we were, um, a, a season was suspended or stopped because of COVID. Um, roughly 3% of fans took up the, 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 the option of a, a season ticket refund. We are completely and utterly grateful um, uh, to everybody um, uh, for the commitment that they've shown to the club um, last season and this season past. Um, uh, giving back £75,000 um, uh, would rip a hole um, uh, in our finances. Um, uh, let's not be about the bush. Part of, and Phil talked about this and being transparent and being honest, some of the messages are not not pleasant, um, it, but we will we'll, we'll, we'll continue to give and we'll, we'll make sure that we give um, it, that honest feedback um, it, and that transparency that everybody's calling for. So recognising that it would cost us £75,000, what we've tried to do is put together a package of getting access to the Premier Cup sport games, um, the, 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 what was the bet thread, um, it, it included in this year's season ticket, um, it having um, a, a, a lottery um, it, so that some fans can get their, their season ticket costs refunded um, and other benefits that we're adding on um, it, as the season will continue to go um, it, about what being a season on, or the benefits of being a season ticket at Falkirk will, will, will be. So apologies if it came out in the wrong way. Apologies if, and I know some people have contacted me saying that it made them or, or I was implying um, uh, that they should feel guilty for asking for refunds? Absolutely not. Let me make that clear. Everybody is entitled to be able to ask for a refund. Um, uh, I hope they don't, because it will mean that less cash that we've got in the club and less cash that we can invest in all the things that Phil's co covered off, importantly, playing squads, youth development, and so on. So there was no no gun to the head on this in, in, in any shape or form. Um, it, it was about recognising and trying to walk that tightrope of looking after the club and trying to get these foundations and build on these foundations as we're talking about and preserving the cash where we can because that's important. People talk about private sector business, you preserve the cash. Um, it, you look after your finances. So looking after that and then um, investing and, and going forward. But if people do want refunds, they should contact us. I think uh, Grant Thompson, John Emery and Gary Hill all had very similar questions. The one that had a slight different variation in the refund and reward piece uh, came from David Young. And he asked, is the board going to offer fans a refund or something similar? Um, will the board apologise for misleading fans last season when he feels there was no transparency, transparency sorry, as to the FTC top up? and the associated donation to charity said he didn't feel it was clear what percentage was being kept by the club and what was donated to charity after a, a misleading call to arms, if you like. Uh, I, I'm not sure it was misleading. I, I apologise again if, 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 if people feel it is misleading. Um, uh, we donated, and I've, I've not got the figures to hand, Lewis. Um, we'll, we'll get seven, that. Seven and, a, seven and a half thousand was donated to Strathcarn. To Strathcarn, OK. So, thanks, Colin. Yes. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, the, the, uh, we decided that we we're going to give a donation to, to our charitable partners. As Colin said, £7,500. I don't think that that was kept under wraps. Um, uh, but, uh, again, if we'll, we'll, we'll look into that and we'll come back and we'll clarify the position. The, the second half of the season ticket questions mainly all related 
to stadium access. So Alan Smith, Christopher Nelson, Scott McGrandles and Gary Wilson all wrote in on this one. Uh, to, to kick it off, uh, let's go with Alan's question, which was, with numbers limited, who decides which season ticket holder gets to attend? And will the club have the sole rights for away game tickets to allow season ticket holders a chance to perhaps attend away games? <laughs> this is probably one of the most difficult questions. I mean, there's difficult personal questions, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and answer this one as far as I can possibly do, because let's be honest, things change certainly weekly, if not daily, um, sure. on, on stadium access. Um, the, the, I, up until yesterday, um, I would have said that there was, there was little likelihood of us having more than 2,000 fans um, in the stadium at any point in the coming months. Um, uh, yesterday, the um, uh, Scottish Government announced, um, uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, an end to social distancing outdoors um, for future events post-August, a date in August. Um, does that mean that we can have um, uh, many more fans in, in, in the stadium? Well, fingers crossed, absolutely. And, and everybody wants that. So at the moment, the only ones that we do know um, uh, that we're restricted for um, uh, are the Premier Sports games, um, uh, the, the, the game against... Albion Rovers and the game against Hamilton Academicals. Um, it, those games are before the restrictions are starting to be, to be eased again. So we know that we're going to be restricted to 1,000 fans. Um, we have mapped out um, it, what that will look like in the stadium, and that means that we'll have to use all three stands um, it, under current social distancing rules. If these are relaxed, then um, it, they, they, it, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to remap it, but that we're, um, we're not banking on that at the moment. Um, in terms of who gets rights um, to be able to get in there, season ticket holders will obviously get first first bite of the cherry. I'm delighted to say that we've got over 620 season tickets sold from last week, which is fantastic. And for the, everybody that's bought and intends to buy, really, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Um, it, that's, that's a fantastic effort in these times um, in particular. So, yeah, the, the, the season ticket holders will have access to there. In terms of away fans and what, what our rights will be to away grounds, I've actually been in touch with um, a, the, 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 the clubs, Air United and Edinburgh City. Um, a, um, um, is that it? Yeah, Edinburgh City and Air a, a United um, a, today um, a, about what is the access going to be like um, a, for us in these games. Uh, but nobody yet knows um, what the position is going to be. Um, I'm guessing, and it will be a guess, that every game will have to be ticketed, um, home and away, um, uh, no, for track and trace purposes apart from anything else. Um, but we're, we're constantly speaking to the SPFL and the SFA um, seeking guidance on what this is going to look like. If I'm completely honest, and I don't mean this is to be critical, I'm often critical of the SFA and the SPFL, I don't mean it to be critical they, 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 this time. They, they are learning. They are learning as much as anybody else is about how do we um, bring foot, fans back to football stadia. And so we will keep everybody informed as soon as we know what the position is. Scott follows that up saying his question is, if season ticket holders will be first in line to watch games at the Falkirk Stadium, how will the hundred, sorry, how will the thousand or two thousand seats be allocated? But from what you're saying there, it's going to be spread across all three stands. But more specifically, he asks, Will there be factors in place to gauge who gets first shout? For example, will returning season ticket holders get any preference over brand new season ticket holders? And what happens, of course, if, let's just say for argument's sake, we are allowed 2,000 people in the stadium and we sell 2,500 season tickets? Yeah, I, 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 we're, go we're going, to, and, and you'll appreciate when I answer this, I just don't want, don't know the answers at the moment because we're, we're, we're talking about hypothetical situations. Um, it, we're, we're, so what we're doing tomorrow, we've got a meeting with Falkirk Council, police, fire brigade, all, all sorts, the, state, the safety advisory group. Um, it, so we've got a meeting with them tomorrow afternoon to work through the detail. We'll also have to have things like, and I should have said this earlier on, phased arrival at the stadiums as it's currently standing. Now, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm saying it's hypothetical is I think the position will be changed over the next few weeks. Um, it, um, and I think we won't have to um, a, um, sanction or allocate tickets in the way that the questioner is asking. I think we'll have far more freedom, hoping we'll have far more freedom to uh, accommodate every season ticket holder at every game. Um, a, um, but do I still think we'll need to have ticketed access because of track and trace? Yes. But the way things are, if you'd asked me 48 hours ago, I wouldn't have been as positive about it. Now I'm feeling much more positive about it. 
And I guess for whatever board member ends up with that um, problem to solve, it must be a bit of a headache because if you have, you know, mum, dad and two kids, if you do some kind of lottery, what happens if mum and, and junior one gets drawn out and then dad and junior number two doesn't? I mean, it's going to be a bit of a logistical nightmare, isn't it? It already is. <laughs> um, it, but but uh, and, and Laura Craig um, and Ronnie, who's been mentioned earlier on, we've got great people at the club who are working round the clock on these types of issues. Um, it, uh, they, they, we've all watched the Euros. Um, it, Gordon Colburn, I know, was at Hamden for one of the games um, it, and has seen the logistics um, it, operating um, it, day in, or, or, in real life, in real time. Um, it, um, not easy. It's not easy to police. It's not easy to control. Um, uh, um, and as I say, we're all learning as we're going here. What we won't do, um, uh, um, and I'll, but this is a commitment, we won't um, uh, make a father and a son or a, or, or a father and a daughter um, uh, um, um, separate. We'll, 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 we'll not say one can get in and one won't. Um, that, we'll, we'll manage that in some kind of way. Difficult, but we'll make sure that doesn't happen. Appreciate it. So everything there was really geared at getting people back into the, you know, the club and the stadium. Um, the next couple of questions from Brian Patterson and David Gillies were around recent departures from the club, specifically on a, from a staff perspective. So uh, Brian asks, has the club come to a contractual and financial agreement with the previous management team and are the potential costs uh, are no longer hanging over the club? And David Gillies asks, is it true that Derek Jackson, the club's former goalkeeping coach, is suing the club for wrongful dismissal due to the way he was sacked towards the end of last season? Um, Two-part answer. Um, the, the people who have left um, have all been, uh, we've reached agreement on. Um, so um, there is nothing hanging over us. We've reached agreements and that's been done. Apart from Derek, um, I'm currently dealing with Derek. Um, um, is he suing us? No, he's not. Um, we've just not reached the final agreement yet, but there is no suit. And, and that must be, to be fair, though, I don't know if that somebody has picked up the, the wrong end of the stick, but is that not quite common in football that, respectively, whenever somebody leaves any club, there's usually the kind of payoff haggling and everything that, that goes with it? Uh, not only in football. I mean, it's, it's, it's in life and in business. Um, it, you've always got um, an agreement um, about when, what happens when you leave an employment. Um, it, so that's what we're doing. Um, it, in football, and, and, and I've learned this over the last couple of years, it's a bit more extreme um, it, because um, it, everybody in football has seen everybody else in football um, it, getting agreements and settling up and um, finalising deals. So, yeah, I, I've, I've got kind of used to doing that over the last couple of years, unfortunately. Um, it, but um, it all, as apart from Derek, as I say, um, it, um, have been settled um, it, and settled amicably. Um, it, and I've no doubt that we'll, 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 we'll reach the same amicable settlement with, with, with Derek as well. We've just not finished it yet. Okay. Louis, can I add into that for a second, just from an, an experience standpoint? Um, we talked earlier about public sector. This is where, or private sector, this is where football and the private sector kind of differ quite wildly. And I think Paul and Gary would, uh, would back me up on this. In football, there comes a point at which you have to turn a team over, whether it's players or whether it's coaching staff, whatever it might be. And there are procedures and processes that, that apply in the private sector that you just can't apply if you're going to release someone um, from a football club. So it unfortunately makes it very, very difficult for a board when they do want to turn a team over um, and bring in new recruits like Paul, like Gary, Tony Kay, Danny, et cetera, et cetera, to be able to do that. But um, as Gary said, we're managing it. Um, uh, every football club goes through this when they turn staff. Okay. I think the, the next topic I'd like to touch on um, is the commercial aspect of things. Uh, some fans wrote in, we had questions from Alan Johnson, Gary Seaton, Donald Steele, Lewis McKenzie and Grant Thompson, all around the commercial aspect. Specifically, a lot of it is to do with the departures recently of Kieran Kazari and, of course, Mr Falkirk, Alex Totten. Uh, so to kick us off uh, on that one, uh, Gary Seaton asks, what is the plan to replace Kieran and Alex? And are we at risk of losing any sponsorship ties in the meantime? Well, let, let, let me try and answer that one. Um, I think it's fair to say that you don't immediately replace people like Alex Totten and Kieran Kazari overnight. Um, as you say, Lewis, uh, Alex is Mr. Mr. Falkirk um, and his 
relationship with so many businesses um, around the Falkirk area, with people around the Falkirk area, will almost never be replaced. And I think we've got to accept that. Um, Kieran uh, had built fantastic relationships, again, with a number of sponsors and advertisers, and, and we won't replace these overnight. So we recognise that's a huge challenge for the club. Um, I think we also recognise that we've got some fantastic sponsors and, and very loyal sponsors, very loyal advertisers, and, and we hope that they will stay with the club um, and that they will recommit to the club as, as we move forward. Um, we are in the, in the process of um, replacing, um, as, as we said earlier, we're replacing both um, positions um, and, and we may almost certainly take that opportunity to do a bit of reorganising behind the scenes because I think if we're honest, um, you know, Phil talked about it earlier, one of the areas that, that, that the board feels has been significantly underinvested for a number of years is, is the whole commercial uh, and retail space. Um, and so we're going to take the opportunity to look at what we do there and, and bring in um, additional resources that will hopefully um, rebuild and redevelop those relationships that are going to be so crucial to the club. I mean, we, we, we mentioned it in one of the, the notes about the importance of season ticket revenue to the club as far as its um, effect on our income stream is concerned. L let's, not, um, let's not kid ourselves that the commercial income stream is every bit as important as season ticket income to, to this club. Um, and we, we are highly dependent on those relationships that we have with sponsors and advertisers. And, and you know, we, we will work diligently to, to try and ensure that um, you know, losing both Kieran and Alex at the same time, which is, yeah, uh, which is far from ideal, um, is, is, is something that we will, uh, we will work very, very hard to, to replace. Um, but recognising that, that that's, that's going to be a challenge, but it's something that we've got to do. And the obvious question the fans are asking is, is why did they both leave at, at, at the same time? Was it just a, a coincidence? Was it something else? Um, as far as Alex is concerned, Alex was 75 years old and uh, enjoyed playing more and more golf. And I think one of the things that Alex realised um, you know, during the period of lockdown when he had the opportunity to spend even more time with his family in golf is, uh, you know, do, do you really want to still be doing what you're doing um, at, at his age? Um, and, you know, he who was an outstanding um, servant to the club and, and that's why he's a lifetime ambassador. But but for Alec, it was quite purely, um, it's time it's time to retire and, and enjoy the rest of your life. Um, Kieran equally, um, let, let's be clear, it was Kieran's decision to leave the club, um, despite you know, some commentary to to uh, to differ from that. It was absolutely Kieran's um, decision to leave the club, um, and he felt it was the right time. We won't go into all the details of that. I think that's quite personal for Kieran, and it would be wrong for us to say that um, to to say things about that. But make no mistake, it, it was Kieran's choice. And, and can I just add very quickly to that? Um, my thanks to Kieran for everything that he's done. Um, it, um, and um, it, we're working through handovers and all the rest of it with him just now. Um, it, but also, um, it, um, Paul Sheeran and I are sitting down with Alec Totten tomorrow, um, it, um, tomorrow as, as, as this has been recorded, um, it, um, to recognise, well, to, A, to introduce him to Paul, but, but as in, in partial recognition of everything that Alec has done for the club um, over many, many years as a supporter, fan, manager, director of football, you, you name it, he's fulfilled all these roles. Um, so we will be celebrating that um, it, once we get fans back into the stadium. Um, it, um, and uh, there, are, there are plans afoot um, it, to recognise um, what Alec has given um, and done for the club over, the, over many years. Um, so watch the space for that, for more news on that as well. You mentioned uh, commercial activities and uh, sponsors being part of that, Gordon. Um, Lewis McKenzie writes in to say, was there any kind of fallout with Central Demolition as main sponsor? And was that in any way linked to Alex's departure, you know, in terms of Alex leaves and it was, it was him that had that relationship? Um, Central Demolition made uh, a decision a number of months ago um, okay. that their time as our um, front of Jersey sponsor was was coming to an end. They, they've been fantastic sponsors of the club for many years. They put a ton of money into the club, and we are 
extremely grateful for that. But but they recognised that given the, the economic situation, it probably wasn't appropriate for them to continue to put um, their name on the front of the jersey. So um, we, we knew that you know, quite a number of months ago. So it was not, it, it was not a consequence of Alec, Alex leaving at all. Um, and, and Central are very, very keen to continue to, um, to put their brand on, um, on the youngsters' jerseys that will come through the Community Trust. And uh, I believe that they, that's, that's something that they're very committed to doing. So uh, they, they were unrelated. Okay. And just to wrap up the the kind of commercial aspects, um, Grant Thompson asks, given the phenomenal income Kieran Kazari and Alex Totten brought into the club, what is the club's commercial and marketing vision for the future going going forwards now? So I kind of touched on that, I think, a little bit, that um, we have a very, um, very clear vision about what we want to achieve both on the retail and the commercial front. I talked a little bit about how we plan to reorganise some of the commercial activities of the club um, to uh, to attract more sponsorship, to attract more advertising, to build and develop more relationships. And we will announce very soon um, the appointment of somebody to lead that role. And I think the fans will be, will be very happy with that. Um, on the retail side, which I think we probably all admit is, is not what we'd like it to be and hasn't been for a number of years, um, and for anyone who's been in the shop recently and who has met um, Jacqueline, um, they, they will realise that we've got somebody in there who is, um, who's a fantastic addition to the staff, um, who has retail in her blood. She's done a great job in the shop um, in, in getting it ready for the new strip launch. And in the last 48 hours, we have just signed a deal um, I think I think I can announce this. Um, somebody will wrap my fingers if I'm not supposed to. Um, with with Grieve Sports and Grieve Sports will become our new only online retail partner. Um, they'll work with us um, on merchandising and, and uh, initially online retailing. Um, but we have a very clear vision with Greaves um, that that Carrie has been instrumental in in developing um, a very clear vision with them about massively growing our, our retailing operation. Um, doubling, tripling it in the next few years. And we're very excited with that. Jacqueline's very excited by it. And uh, I, I, I think you will see very significant differences in our whole retailing operation developing over the, over the months. Okay. George, do you mind if I add to that? Of course. Sure. Uh, with respect to Greaves, um, yes, we have, we have signed an agreement with Greaves. We're very excited. Um, you'll see some updates to our online platform. In the future, you'll be able to use your smartphone to place an order right while you're sitting in your seat. Uh, we have Greaves that will provide some additional IT help to help us with inventory levels and to help us with replenishing merchandise in the shop. Uh, they'll be taking a fresh look at our retail merchandise. We'll be keeping the items that we are so proudly sold in the past, but looking at bringing in some new items as well. Um, and they'll be more to come. We expect it to be a gradual change, but by mid-July, you should see more of a instrumental change. Um, in addition, later on, Mr. Holtz and Mr. Sheeran will talk about some of the sporting equipment that Greaves will be providing to our professional athletes. So there's much to come uh, on that front as well. Okay, thank you for that. Something, to, something different for the fans to, to look forward to. The next uh, big topic, and I have to say this was one of the most contentious topics of the night, um, was around investment, all aspects of investment. Um, specifically, uh, a lot of it is to do with yourself, Phil and Carrie, and a lot of it is to do with a, a rumoured investment from a, a group called the Navy Blue Group. Now, we had about 10, 12 questions specifically on this. Um, there, there's many that I, I can go with here. Some of them, as you can imagine, are, are duplicated, but just to confirm some of the names, so Gary Hill, Gary Seaton, Lewis McKenzie, Jim Patterson, Alan Johnson um, are, are all in here, as long as Brian Patterson. But I'm going to start with one uh, or a few from David Gillies. Um, and uh, it's again a three-parter, so we'll, we'll take it in bits. First of all, we were led to believe that the Rollins increasing their shareholding by the 31st of May was basically a formality, but there hasn't been any further news of this, though. Have they indeed increased their shareholding as was indicated initially, or if they haven't, can you give an update as to why that is the case? 
Who's going to answer that? <laughs> let, let, me, let, let, let me start. <laughs> well, I was going yeah, to answer. I just, couldn't, I just couldn't get myself off mute, unfortunately. <laughs> IT, IT challenged here. Um, I, I'm going to answer this basically because it kind of relates to the shares and the investment agreement that we struck with Phil and Carrie going back in, into January. Um, you know, after acquiring their initial, initial stake in the club, it's, it's always been their philosophy to continue to invest, but in partnership you know, with the fans. Um, their, their initial investment actually recognized this and the um, share issue and, and, and buyback uh, was always part of that agreement, you know, allowing um, uh, 90 new fans, but also you know, close to 40 existing fans uh, to increase the, their ownership in the club. You know, swapping out the three former MSG for, for 55, uh, 55 shareholders. Um, there will be further issues of uh, shares. Um, um, the introduction, introduction of that money into the club will, will also facilitate uh, Phil and Carrie to, to invest uh, ad additional money. Uh, it, it's been part, again, like I said, it's been part of their philosophy you know, as the fans invest in the club, then Phil and Cali invest in the club, and we'll, we'll grow together. It's 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 a partnership in that in that respect. And that uh, you know, they've clearly said they don't want to take a majority stake. If they had, they would have done by now. Uh, but it's building the, uh, the, the sh their shares uh, in in line with uh, with the, the fans as well. There's been so many rumours flying around on social media and different forums, as, as is always the case, around uh, this, this the, the Navy Blue Group. And perhaps part of the trouble is there's not been a formal statement from their side of things yet. Um, but David continues and he says, um, the club has recently turned away circa 600,000 of investment from local fans. In the current climate, surely the club is in no position to knock back such a large sum of money. Why was this decision taken? And in doing so, does the board uh, feel they are fulfilling their role by ensuring you do the best thing for the club at all times? And do you think it's reasonable for the club to come out complaining about the 75,000 costs of refunding fans who bought season tickets when they've technically knocked back a much greater amount of investment into the club? So let, let, let me try and... Let me try and talk about this because um, I've, I've seen and I've been made aware of a lot of what's on social media. Um, Actually, sorry, God, can I interject just, just a moment? Um, one thing I've become aware of, can we just clarify the number to begin with? Because I've seen everything from 400,000 to 1.1 million. And I don't want to go down the Celtic Seville calculator route here. So can we just establish like as, as a baseline well, I appreciate you can maybe can't tell us who's behind the bid and all these things if they're confidential, but can, can you tell us a confirmed amount as a starting point? No, okay. because there was never a confirmed amount. Right. Okay. And, 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 I'll, and, and, I'll, exp and I'll explain why um, I, I, as I kind of try and... I, firstly, I'd, I'd say, you know, we're pretty disappointed that, that the details of something that certainly the board considered to be very confidential discussions... Um, have found their way onto social media. That, that, that's a real disappointment. But I do think now that they're there, um, I, I think we have to um, clear up a number of the misconceptions um, about that, Lewis. And, and, and you know, certainly the, num the number is one of those things. Um, I'd say, I'd say firstly, um, the board did not reject an offer of investment from Navy Blue they withdrew from discussions before any formal offer was made. So that's the first thing to make clear to the fans. The board did not reject an offer of investment. It was withdrawn by Navy Blue before any formal offer was made. Secondly, I would say we asked um, repeatedly to meet with the entire Navy Blue group, um, and those requests were never fulfilled. Um, we only ever were allowed to talk to the representatives. And in fact, two, two days, fi finally, there was a meeting scheduled. Um, two days before that meeting was scheduled to take place, the meeting was canceled by the Navy Blue Group, along with a statement that said they were withdrawing from discussions. And that was disappointing, um, but that's the reality of, um, 
of what, what happened. I think the third thing I would say is, and I'm not going to go into huge amounts of details, I don't think that's appropriate, but the discussions with Navy Blue made it clear that there were a number of preconditions associated with their proposed investment in the club. I don't think it's helpful to state what they were, um, but they included one specific condition that the board simply could not deliver. It was out with the board's authority or ability to do that. And others that were directly in contradiction with votes that had been cast by the club's shareholders. Um, and again, we were not prepared and, and in fact, were not empowered to make those decisions. So, so we, we were clearly in a place where this was not going to work. Um, but I'll re-emphasise that the board did not turn down an offer of investment. Um, Navy Blue Group removed themselves from discussions with the board. Um, and I'll, I'll let them explain why, why they did that. I think I'd probably conclude by saying, and I'll reiterate what we said before, and Gordon said it, this board is entirely um, supportive of increased fan ownership. And we've talked about the three-legged stool model before. We've gone to get approval to issue over 3 million new shares. We made it very clear at both the AGM and the EGM that we were committed to a very balanced ownership model for the club where it was majority owned by the fans. We are absolutely committed to that. We remain committed to it. And, and frankly, we welcome um, investment proposals from fans that are committed to the ambition that we have for the club to take it back into the Premiership, but importantly, who are willing to work collaboratively to deliver it. Um, and that's probably all I'd say on it at this point in time, because what I don't want to find we're in is a situation where things are said, where um, positions become so entrenched that we can never recover from it. That's not good for the club. Um, because we want to see investment from in the club. We want to see it from the fans and we welcome it. But it has to be reasonable and it has to come without a set of preconditions that the board simply can't deliver on. From a, a financial... Do you mind if I just add a little bit to what Gordon said? Because it, it really directly involves Kerry and I as well as, as, as you know one of the major investors in the club. And I just want to reiterate and support what Gordon said there. We are committed to the three-legged stool approach that has been talked about. And that three-legged stool, for people who don't, who don't know what it is, it's outside investment, like investment that, that Carrie and I bought to the club. It's the investment of local businesses, like Navy Blue or others, um, and then the fans themselves, um, the fan association and so on. We believe that that model is the right approach, that that model needs to be a balanced model where no one group, like, say, for example, the old MSG, can push through their own agenda. So we want a balanced model where all boats rise on that same tide uh, and where we're all investing together and taking the club forwards together. We welcome that. We welcome anyone who wants to bring that forwards and have meaningful and open discussions with us about that. We would support it, and, and the door is always open. Um, so just, again, to reiterate what Gordon said, we're not pushing any investment away. Uh, in fact, we, we would love to see local businesses, local business people involved on the board with board seats, with investment in the club to help us take this thing forward. Because we think the future for Falkirk is very bright right now. It's exciting. And that's the, the point we want to get to about all this is we can spend a lot of time on the past, but really it's about taking this club forwards. And that's what everybody on this call is, is focused on doing. And I'll reiterate what you're saying too. Falkirk is a community-based club. Our desire was to be yep. and is to be minority shareholders. But a, but a part of that journey and not the majority. And I think that answers Brian Patterson's question because he made the point about, well, if we're selling a, a large stake in the club to somebody overseas, surely we should also be selling it to the local community as well. And I think you have love, love to. We'd love to. nail in the head <laughs> on that one. Um, yep. Gordon, the final part of David's question was uh, not so much from a detailed point of view, but purely from a financial point of view. So if there's been no extra investment um, from this first point and the extra potential 600k from the Navy Blue Group being, he said, knocked back, you've confirmed that it was a withdrawn would be a more accurate description. Um, how are we as a club going to 
fill that hole of nearly, you know, eight, nine hundred, a million pounds that could have been used to, to build a team capable of winning this division and getting us back to the championship? I think that's a great question. Um, and I wish I could I wish I could sit here tonight and, 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 and wave a magic wand that said, here's where five, six, eight, nine hundred thousand pounds is going to come from. Um, I, I, because as a club, you know, and, and I'm sure Gary and, and, and Paul will, will testify to this. We, we're committed to give these guys um, a, a playing squad budget that, that will get us out of this league and hopefully we'll win this league. And, and we're committed to invest significantly um, to do that. That will undoubtedly um, put us in a position where our, our expenditures will significantly exceed our income um, in the current season. Um, now, fortunately, we've been able to carry a surplus from last season, um, and that's all legacy for those people who've got long memories, and I'm sure many of the fans have when we talked about this at the AGM. Um, you know, we carried some money from the previous season. Um, we've, we managed to, to we, well, we got through a lot of that last year, to be perfectly honest, but there is still some left, um, and, and we will use that uh, as efficiently and as effectively as we can. But let's be under no illusions. This year is going to be a very, very tough year financially. Um, everybody should understand that. And, and the board will do its absolute utmost to ensure that we, that we invest in the club, that we invest in the playing squad, and that we achieve what we all want to achieve is the promotion out of this league. Just to wrap up the, the sort of navy blue and, and fill and carry investment aspect before we go into the fan investment part, uh, everything... Uh, or rather all of these questions that came in were very much related to, you know, what blocked this bid, who blocked this bid, why did it not happen, etc. cetera. Uh, we do have one question, which was on the other side of that. So, so just to give balance, uh, it came from Gary Seaton and he was saying, following on from, you know, the, the bid not happening, he said, can you tell us, do you think it was a genuine attempt uh, to help the club or was it perhaps insincere or meddling in some way? I, I think I've already answered that question and probably not worth saying a lot more on it. Fair enough. Um, I guess the point about not wanting to, to get entrenched is, is a valid one. So perhaps a little discussions happen behind behind closed doors. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, what I would say is I, I, I think we, we, we had a group of fans who genuinely wanted to invest in the club and wanted to help. Um, but, but, we, but the conditions that went with that help were, were simply not, possible for the board to go with and is it safe to say then though that i guess in summary if you know i appreciate you can't tell us all on this call exactly what the exact criteria and stuff were and who was involved in the bid but is it safe to say that if an agreement could be reached on whatever these criteria were that you know the, the navy blue group investment bid is not necessarily dead i i'd, I'd love to think that there are um people in that group and, and others who are still very, very interested in investing in the club, being part of the decision-making process in the club, um, you know, wanting to be on the board on the club and share their, their input and their, and, their, and their expertise in taking this club forward. I'd love to believe that. I do believe that. And the door is absolutely open for them. Okay. Lewis, can I, can I add one thing to that? I, I think Gordon's covered it very, very, very well. Mm -hmm. um, it's just to say that, you know, the, the last thing this club needs right now is more instability. We've gone through, the reason we're in the, the situation we're in is because we've gone through so much instability. Uh, and what we need now is stability. We need infrastructure. We need processes in place. We need people in place that can take the club forward. We need to implement what we can to, to bring this club back to the championship and then back to the premiership. That's what we're focused on. That's what we're all about. If anyone wants to join us on this journey, as, as Gordon said, the door is wide open. Please come and knock on it. Come on in, talk to us and be part of it because it is an exciting time. It's the right time to join us. But in joining us, let's, let's take it forwards together in a stable and buildable, scalable fashion. Okay. And, and on that point, I guess that brings us on nicely because the next kind of topic I wanted to discuss was, uh, again, investment, but specifically fan investment. So we had three fans. We had Dean Walker, Ryan Didcock and Steve McDonald right in regarding the, the fan investment scheme and the new sort of supporters trust or the, the rebranding of uh, 
what was the old Bairns Trust. There's now a new model superseding that. So if you bear with me here, uh, Steve probably sums it up best when he says, the board is on record as saying it wants meaningful involvement of supporters in running our club. Last week's season ticket marketing included a commitment of a, quote, significant shareholding to the new fans organisation in recognition of Falkirk fans' efforts. The same marketing mentioned a sum of 75k owed to fans last season and 90k for the season before. Falkirk fans have backed their club to the hilt through this crisis, despite many of them facing financial hardships of their own. They gave the club tens of thousands more through 50-50 tickets, online sponsorships, cardboard cutouts and everything else. Uh, he goes on to say beneficiaries of Falkirk fans' generosity include some of the major shareholders, just as it was uh, with Back the Bairns in 1998. And, and perhaps the key bit here, Falkirk fans don't want to harm the club and ask for money back, but they equally shouldn't be taken for granted. Therefore, will the board now commit to give the new fans organisation a shareholding matching what the Falkirk fans have given up over the last two seasons. Who's best placed to answer that one? Gordon Wright. Okay, yeah, I'll take a stab. I mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult to put, to put a monetary value on that. Um, it, it's just not, you know, come, it doesn't come down to... I was going to say dollars and cents because I work for an American company uh, rather than for Phil and carry, but to pounds and to pounds and pence. Um, you, you take into account the volunteers and match day, uh, the video crew, the people that work behind the scenes, the work that you do yourself. Uh, it is very, very difficult to put uh, an absolute value on that and, and give that to give that to the fans. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't want to, um, and we, we are going to make a, a contribution. Um, to the fans group. They, they already own something like 3% uh, of, of the club. Um, and we would hope to continue over a period of climb. As, as, as Gordon has said, you know, the financial climate isn't great for the club here, but you know, I, I don't think this would just be a, a one-off uh, donation. This is a, a donation to kickstart it. There may be opportunities to do different things you know, with the fans group over a period of years, as the club uh, improves its financial stability, as we move through the leagues, uh, and it'll be an ongoing process rather than than, than a one-off uh, one-off donation. So, so while that you know exact number is still being decided, is it safe to say though that the club is looking to do something to to give that a, a kickstart and help that fans shareholding really kind of get off the ground? Yeah, most definitely, Lewis. That that's our intention. We're, we're um, as we said at, at previous meetings, we're very supportive of uh, the fans organisation. Um, we stand by the fact that we know um, some fans weren't able to participate in the um, in the March uh, share issue. You know, we kind of set the threshold at four hundred pound investment. Um, that's primarily due to the, the work that goes around uh, maintaining the investment, uh, EGMs. It, it has to kind of reach a kind of critical threshold. Uh, I did receive questions about fans wanting to pay by installments, wanting to pay regularly up. Uh, and, and that's really, I kind of directed them to the, the fan shareholders group. You know, a, a large number of fans paying a small amount of money each month can have a significant impact in, in the ability to purchase shares and create create a voice in the club. And that's that's one of the legs of the stools we, we talked about. Dean Walker and Ryan Didcock follow up, but basically asking the same question, saying, you know, they would like to buy uh, fat shares in the club. Um, will they be offered anytime soon? And uh, can somebody, even if it's a fairly modest amount, can a fan come along and get some new shares? We will be planning a, a share issue uh, during the course of, of this season. So there will be an opportunity for fans to invest either individually or uh, with the new fan share, shareholders group. Um, they, they, I think, published something on Facebook uh, not so long ago to say they're in the, the final throes of getting read, ready to launch. Um, we've 
met with them uh, over the course of the season and the close season to discuss how we can help them. They, they are an independent organisation. They they set their own their own timetable as to when suit, when suits them to go live, what their agenda is. But uh, we are looking forward to them being involved actively in the club and to taking their their seat on the board as well. Okay, thank you for that. Well, it's ideally, as we said, ideally, you know, one of the things that attracted Kerry and I to Falkirk was this three-legged stool approach and, and, and not being the majority shareholders. Ideally, we'll be in a position in the not-too-distant future, but as soon as we can do it, we will. But we'll be in a position where the club is owned a third, a third, a third, you know, a third by outside investors like ourselves who perhaps got deeper pockets, a third by local business people, and a third by the you know the, the fan on the street who who can subscribe on a monthly basis a small amount. Ideally, that's where we want to get to, and and we'll try and get there as fast as we can with with the help of everybody around Full Kirk and the club. And and you started, and I was going to actually say to Lewis as well as as many of the questions have revolved around the Rollins investment. The most important group are the supporters, are the fans. So if we haven't said it before, let's say it now, please. Thank you for supporting the club during one of the most unprecedented times yeah. we've ever seen. Thank you. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's easy for us to forget. Or it's easy to look back on the year and say, you know, well, we, we're kind of coming out of COVID now and, you know, what? thank God the pandemic's coming to an end and everything else. The truth is, financially speaking, and for businesses, this year we're going into is actually a much more difficult year than the year we've come out of, because during the last twelve months we've had, we, you know, we've had furloughs, we've had grants, we've had money from government, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We're going into a year where we're going to have probably limited fans in the stadium, and um, we're going into a year where sponsors and other people around the club are looking at how do they cut their cloth accordingly because of economic environments for them as businesses. Um, and yet we've still got, you know, all of the cost elements, if not increased cost elements of, of putting teams on the field and, and you know, managing the stadium um, to be uh, to be safe for fans to return to. So the, the real impact of what we've just gone through from a financial standpoint is right ahead of us. Interesting. Thank you all for that one. Uh, I think our, our next big topic of the night, and this was arguably, I would say it was up there with the, the investment piece. Uh, there's been a lot of chatter recently around the Crunchy initiative. Now, for anyone who's not aware, uh, it is the, you know, the, the drive by the fans to rename the, the South Stand after essentially the greatest player to wear the navy blue. Uh, so we had questions from Lorna Armstrong, David Gillies, Graham Ross, Jim Miller, Gary Wilson. But actually, I can tell you we've had formal contact from the Crunchy initiative uh, and they've asked if we could pose two questions. One is around uh, the the board's commitment. Uh, you know, essentially, is the board committed? We'll get to it in a second. And the second one, and all the other questions, really are them expressing how they feel they've been treated at the moment. They they seem to be very unhappy with this, and it's something that's garnered quite a lot of um, heat again on social media and forums. So it'd be good to to shed some light. So the first question, and as I say, these are both directly from the Crunchy Initiative. So the first one is, um, we, you know, there's tried to be a, will the board agree to complete the project the way it was agreed to by Gary Deans on the phone during the 12th of April to our member and agree to complete it in the spirit it was intended when first accepted by the then board, including Gary Deans himself, in 2019, that this is a fan-led initiative working with the club to honour Kevin in the best way possible and one befitting his significance to both the club and the support. Can I answer because because I've been named in that I want to answer first. Um, a, are we committed? Yes. Um, a, um, I think the question actually goes to some of the problems that we've had um, and why there's the the, 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 the feelings are going are, are quite strong and everything here. We rake over detail. Um, uh, about how do we want to be able to achieve what we all want to be able to achieve, which is the naming of a stand after Kevin McAllister. We're completely committed to that, completely. We're now going to talk about the detail, and we need to talk about the detail about how what do we do and how does it get in place. Um, uh, 
taking a, 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 a moment in time um, or an entrenched position, to use Gordon's words earlier on about the investment, isn't helpful on either side. Um, so that's all I'll say because I was asked specifically, are we committed um, to um, the renaming of the stand? Absolutely, 100%. A lot of the fans. Do you mind if I add as well? Because I, I, I think that as a board, we. I, I'm excited about renaming the stand, the Kemba McAllister stand. And I'd like to say, and to answer Lewis's question directly, the board unanimously agreed on three things with respect to the Crunchy Initiative. First, to rename the South stand after Kevin McAllister. The second is to donate a large portion of the stand, a prominent section that could be potentially sold to an advertiser or sponsor to have the Kevin McAllister lane to properly represent him. And the third thing that we committed and unanimously decided as a board is to do this ongoing with the fans. This is a fan-led initiative, and we, we really honor that. Um, so to answer your question, those three things have been completely and totally agreed upon. And, and that's interesting. So the one thing I would say on that is, is, that, is that there's, when you get into details of this, it's, it's, it's obviously very detailed because you're doing something with the stand. There was there were certain parts of the proposal that that from a health and safety standpoint um, really wouldn't work. Um, you know, initial part of the proposal was to put uh, signage on the front of the stand, on the on the edge of the stand. Yeah. Well, the truth is we have no fascia board on the edge of the stand. So if you put if you put metal letters up there with the high winds that we sometimes get in Falkirk, mm -hmm. you have got the health and safety issue of of losing those letters. We've just lost roof panels this year. We've lost two floodlights because of storm damage. You know, as a board, we have a commitment to make sure that whatever we do to honor Kevin's name um, is done in a safe manner. So hence why we suggested that space at the back of the stand be dedicated to the signage. So it's ready to go. Signage can go on the back of the stand. Signage can go over the door. Um, the, the, the club will work with uh, the fans to establish a friendly game, to to kick off, if you will, and to commemorate the opening of the stand. Um, it's all there. So if I, if any of the, it sounds like the Crunchy Initiative will be will be watching this video. If they, if they have, then please tell them to get back in touch again because it's been three months since anybody was in touch with us about getting this completed. So we'd love to get it completed and, and uh, hopefully get it completed in this coming season when we've got fans in the stadium yeah. to appreciate it and enjoy it. And Lewis, to, to answer your question too, I think some of the confusion came about, um, and Phil and I joined the board in January, but I think the original proposal was made in September mm -hmm. and it included having something attached to the top of the roof of the stand that would be above the supporters' heads. We were concerned about the strong winds mm -hmm. and therefore that particular way in order to rename the stand from a safety issue standpoint was deemed impossible. However, we didn't want to throw out this incredible idea. So the idea is still there. The idea is still agreed upon. It's just, how do we, how do we do it safely? And how do we do it in, in the honor that I think that that Crunchy deserves? The other, the other thing I would add to that is collaboratively. Um, it, um, yes. it, 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 we, we want to be able to work together to be able to make sure that we do this properly. Um, and to take the example of um, a, a friendly game, um, it, we've got to work with Gary and with, 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 with Paul and the squad, obviously, to be able to make sure that that's possible. But equally, we need to make sure that it's, it's, uh, we, we, we get as many fans in the, in the ground as possible um, uh, to make sure that, 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 that Kevin is honoured appropriately. So the only plea that I would add to everything that's been said there is let's do this collaboratively. Um, and um, a, let's let's not take difficult difficult positions that make it make it difficult to be able to get to get to where we need to be able to get to. Gary, probably a, a difficult question to hear, but the, the second part of this is um, the Crunchy Initiative have basically vocalised how they're currently feeling. Uh, I'm going to put this one your way because uh, again, there's a name uh, in it. The Crunch Initiative say, we've tried to receive an explanation as to why you chastised a couple of our members and removed one from negotiations. Uh, there's been no satisfactory explanation received, despite some very spurious allegations being made and behaviour that, in their opinion, can only be described as bullish and vindictive. Since the board have stood by their position to ostracise one of the group at an official board meeting, with the chairman uh, still failing to offer any proper explanation, 
Does the board consider itself unaccountable for their own actions? And do they think they have acted appropriately in the way they have treated the Crunchy initiative? Here we've got an example of some of the problems that we've got here, um, it, because it becomes a bit mudslinging. Now, I'll take, my, take my, 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 uh, my, my line from what Gordon said earlier on about investment. Let's not um, uh, dig ourselves into trenches. Um, uh, let, let's make this a collaborative process. Um, uh, we, what, we, what I sought to do in discussions with the Crunchy Initiative uh, was to reach a consensus about how do we make this work. Um, uh, the difficulty came because um, uh, personalities did get in the way. So the, the, con the conversation around that and the discussions around that was, let's get around um, uh, those problems and let's get around those difficulties and let's plan for how do we make this work. Um, so we're completely open um, uh, to be able to continue that dialogue. But the dialogue has to be open and it has to be honest and it has to be transparent um, on both sides. Um, it, and it has to be with a view to make, making sure that we can get the naming of the stand done at an appropriate time and in an appropriate way. We've got responsibilities as a board, as we've talked about health and safety there, for example. But take, take a wider aspect of this. The stadium is the, is the Falkirk Stadium. It's the Falkirk, home of Falkirk Football Club. Everything that goes up in there has to be appropriate. It has to look right. Everything has to be has to be um, a, a suitable for Falkirk Football Club that we're all proud of and that Kevin McCarthy are really proud of. Now, I'm not saying it wasn't, but every time we had a conversation around the, uh, around these issues, um, differences of opinion were expressed. And these differences of opinion became ditches that people were digging, in, di digging into. Um, it, and that's the kind of thing that, we, 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 that, that caused the, 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 if there are been problems, problems, but also um, it got in the way of resolution. Um, it, now, what I'm saying is we are completely open um, it, to uh, re-engaging and making sure that we can get to where we want to be able to get to. I've said that several times now. Um, it, and that's the plea. Let's get to where we all want to be able to get to, which is the renaming of the stand um, and having um, Kevin honoured in the way that we want to be able to get honoured. And it's a, it's, a, it's a great idea that it was designed by the supporters. I personally think it's an amazing idea, and I'll personally apologise if anybody feels chastised or in any way hurt in discussing this idea, because I'm all for it. Can I just ask a little bit further on that one, Carrie? Because we had one question come in, and it was a difficult one for yourself, but um, it was on the Crunchy Initiative, and it came from Gary Wilson. He asked, uh, essentially, if you were really running the show and if there was any issues in terms of tension between Alex or Kieran, and specifically, he asks, were you in any way or so against the crunchy sign going up? But is it safe to say that from what you've just said, you're actually very much in favour of it? Yeah, can I? Can I'm I, 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 so, so sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, let me let me tell Melissa. My wife's good, uh, Lewis, but she's not that good. Um, <laughs> 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 no, it's absolutely, it's the board's position uh, that we are supportive of the Kevin McAllister stand uh, and getting that open as soon as we can, obviously within a reasonable time frame when we've got supporters back in the ground because we want to celebrate it appropriately with our fans there. No, no one on the board is standing in the way. Um, there were proposals made, that, as we said, that from a health and safety standpoint, we couldn't support as a board because we have to think of the bigger picture of Falkirk Football Club. But no, everybody is supportive of getting this done. Uh, I, I, and certainly Phil and Carrie Rawlins, are, you can count us amongst that. We are very supportive of getting the South Stand renamed and, and getting, the, uh, getting, getting this initiative behind us so we can move on with other things too. Well, thank you. I appreciate the clarity. And I know it's been uh, difficult to hear some of that. Um, and as I say, we had questions from, from other people as well, but I think that the key ones there were, you know, the fact that the Crunchy Initiative decided to engage directly. So that's why we've gone down that route. Um, the next thing, uh, and it kind of feeds into this, is I'd like to discuss fan relations as a club, as a board, the relationship with the fans. Um, so... Grant Thompson sums it up quite, quite succinctly when he says, fans have been constantly criticising the club's failure to communicate with them efficiently and transparently for the last few seasons. Why is the club so bad at this? I think I'm happy to take that one, Lewis. I wasn't sure if you were going to get to a question that would fall in my wheelhouse, so this has finally got, got around to me, but 
I mean, I, I think what we'd say, and there's, there's probably a lot to say on communications, ironically enough, but for for me, the club could always improve its communications, and that's not something that's unique to Falkirk. It's unique to most companies who can probably communicate a lot better, and I, I make a living out of supporting companies do that. For me, there's always a, a fine balance in that. Fans want to know absolutely everything that goes on in the club, and that's completely understandable, but... As a, as a business, we have to realise that it's just not feasible to let the fans know every single thing that happens at, at the, the club. The other things on, on comms that is probably different to things like finances is everyone's got an opinion on comms. What, what I say will be received in one way by someone and received in a completely different way by someone else. So I think Gary made a really good point there about the, the season ticket, £75,000 figure. In one way, people will see that as a, as a, a guilt trip and other people will see it as an honest assessment of actually what, what's going to happen. So there's, a, there's an element on comms that you're never going to please everyone. And trust me, <laughs> trust me, I know that. I've got years of experience of trying to please everyone in comms and it just doesn't work. What I would say in, in terms of comms in, in the past year or so, this kind of event that we've done, this is probably the fifth or the sixth Zoom call that we've done over the past year. Not all of them have been completely public. We've done them with shareholders. We've done them as part of the AGM, the EGM. We've done them with selected fan groups as well. So I don't necessarily think communications has been limited, but I certainly think we could do better. The club's got a history of, of statement after statement after statement. That was something when, when I've come onto the board, I wanted to, to move away from. I don't want to get in a routine of we have to issue a statement every week or every two weeks. Last summer, there was, there was obviously quite a, a, a peak in activity when we had the pandemic, league reconstruction in the field. So there was a lot to say, but generally as a board, we'll, we'll communicate when, when there is something to say. I, I think also in comms as well, it hasn't been helped by the fact that no one's been around being able to get into the club and, and speak to people face to face. So we've had to rely on written statements and, and online uh, sessions. And we all know that the written word can be can be mis misconstrued, but we know we can do better. And speak for myself and, and Gordon Colburn, and I know Gordon Wright has have done this as well. And Gary, uh, most of the board, we've, we've, we've actually engaged with, with supporters individually now through emails or, or meeting people for coffee. And actually, the response you get from that is is much better. So that's something that we want to continue. And probably one of the final things I'll, I'll say on comms is. Comms is a two-way street, so yes, we can certainly communicate, but what we want as well is fans to come and communicate with us. We've published our email addresses before, and we can we can certainly do that again and allow people to get in touch directly with us. If you've got a, a problem, a concern, a question, get in touch and ask us. I, I see it far too often that you go on to Pine Bovril or you go on to the COYB page, and it's people just posting rumour and things that are completely half half truths and whatever it is, come and speak to us if you've got a question. We'll, we'll give you as much information as we possibly can and that'll allow you to make an opinion. You're certainly not always going to agree with everything the board does, but at least you'll have a, a justification and a, and, a, and a rationale to why we've made decisions. So if fans want openness and transparency, it goes back to, to what Gary said. Sometimes you're not going to like what you hear, but we are making an effort, but we do do appreciate we do need to do more. Dean Walker says communication, uh, communication with the club has been slower and less frequent since the previous media officer, Connor Park, left the club. Uh, and he noticed that the, the Rollins family have recently said that this is an area they are looking to improve upon. Uh, is there any new details on what actions will or are being taken regarding this so that how the club can improve moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it comes back to what, what I said there. We, there has been less statements coming out of the club because I, I felt in the past we've probably had too many statements coming out from the club. I, I hear it quite a lot as well that people are, are fed up hearing from the board. They want more football content on the social media feeds. They don't want to hear as much politics. Obviously, people who are tuning into this want, want some of the politics in the background, but ultimately we're all folk fans. We want to hear who... Paul and Gary are signing. We want to know what the squad's looking like next season. We want to know where we're going to end up in the league. We want all that football content. So we've made a conscious decision to try and give supporters a bit more football content. We've got Andrew and Adam who are working their backsides off in the, in the club to, to generate new new media content. So that's 
it's been a conscious decision to, to, to have a bit more football content now. There, can I just, again, can I just add to what Colin said there? Because we said right at the beginning of the call that, that we're committed to doing this. I think one of the, um, one of the things that, that we should apologise for is that over the last couple of months, we haven't communicated as much as we could, uh, as frequently as we could. And, you know, that's one of the things, obviously, we're trying to put right on this call with, uh, with everything that we've talked about, all the announcements we've made. The achievements, etc., etc., etc. But you know, I'll be honest with you. The way, if you want to reach us, the way to reach us is not through social media. Because um, I know, speaking personally for Kerry and I, we gave up on social media over five years ago, um, and probably the best thing we ever did, quite frankly, because we got most of our lives back. Um, so it's it's not through social media, but you know, it's through, as Colin said, reaching out to the club. We will, I think, in the next few days, uh, if I'm right, Colin, publish a an email address for the board if we can yeah. um, get that done. So we're going to publish a, an email address that, that, that you can ask your questions directly to the board. Come to us. We've got nothing to hide. Uh, we've got nothing to hide behind. And we're going to be as transparent as we can be. And you have our commitment as we move forward to making this um, as, as transparent, as open as we can be and telling, telling the fans exactly what's going on at the club. As Colin said, sometimes, you know, the fans might not like the answer because – uh, sometimes it's warts and all, um, but we'll share it with you. And I'd like to add, too, that it, as hurtful as some questions may be or, or as transparent as they may be, I welcome them. It means that the fans are engaged. Yeah. We, we tr so please keep asking them, no matter how difficult they are yeah. for us to answer, because I'd rather get the questions. Yep. No, I appreciate that openness. I think the fans will, too, undoubtedly. Um, Colin, there, there was one third uh, piece around comms and fan relations. Um, I, I don't know if it's specifically one for you or, or the board as a whole. Um, while we had a huge amount of activity around the Crunchy Initiative, the Navy Blue Group, the season ticket refunds, all these things, for me, this is actually one of the most important questions of the night. And it comes from Brian Cram. And Brian says, how does the club repair the broken relationship with its supporters. He said he feels that the lack of communication since the downturn in form in March and subsequent departures from key positions at the club are very concerning. As a result, I feel very disconnected from the club at the moment and don't have a real desire to continue supporting the club just now. Now, surely if he feels that way, the worry is other fans might too. So to go back to his initial point, how does the club seek to repair what, what he says is a is a broken relationship with fans. How can we do that? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to kick that one off and then if others want to, to jump in it, but there's, I think there's, there's, there's several layers to this. I think one layer to it is how do we get the fans back on side? I think in a, in a, a, a real fashion is a winning team on the park is, is a really important factor to that. I think probably people have been influenced over the last couple of seasons by by poor performances, so that's driven a lot of people away from it. So I think that's one element for it. I think over the past year or so as well, the enforced distance that supporters have actually had from the stadium and the club because of COVID hasn't helped matters. Traditionally, the club have done a lot of community events and, and had people in at the stadium, whether it's open training sessions or whatever it may be, we've, we've lost that. So there's been a bit of disconnect that's come about from that. Um, I think doing more of these events, giving opportunities for supporters to communicate with the board and actually learning about others as people, that's something we, we probably could have done a bit more of as well. And I, I think one of the other points you mentioned there is, is important. We've had quite a, a turnover in terms of not just playing staff, but manager staff, Kieran, Alex moving on. We're going to have new people in behind the scenes. So there's a, a lot of relationship building that needs to be done uh, over the course of this season so that people have faith and confidence in the people that are, are running the club, not just on the football side, but also on the, the admin and the board side. So it's, there's no silver bullet that I can say if you do this, the, the, the relationship's going to, to improve overnight. Um, but a combination of those factors and a bit of understanding from the from the supporters as well about how difficult a position the club's been over the, over the past five years or or perhaps even longer would, would go a long way as well. So I don't know if, if others have want to chip in on their thoughts as well. 
the only thing I would add to that, I think it's a, it's a great summary, Colin, um, I, 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 and, and I'm not going to repeat any of it. This is your club. Um, it, this is this is all of our club. Um, it, we're, we're all Falkirk supporters. Um, it, um, and and I, I can't emphasise enough um, what Colin's saying about um, you approaching us um, it, as well as us approach as us telling you what's going on or or, 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 or um, it, conveying what's going on. Um, but this is your club. You are Falkirk. You should not feel disconnected. Um, if things need to be changed and if things need to be challenged, challenge us. Um, uh, um, and, 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 and we'll listen and we'll change if we think it's the right thing to do, we'll go off and do. Um, uh, um, it, it is that two-way street that either Phil or Carrie said as well. Um, uh, um, it's important that we hear from you, but it's important that you feel um, uh, that you're contributing to, to, to the future of the Bogart Football Club. That's where that connection really lies. Well, thank you for that. I think we're going to, to move on more so towards football matters now. But just before we do, we have two questions on, I've badged them up as infrastructure questions. Uh, so the first one, uh, I was in favour of the artificial pitch when it was installed, but I have changed my mind considering the amount of injuries that we sustained last season. I think some were caused by the pitch. Does the club have any plans to replace the pitch with grass? And can I say the only surprise in this question is it didn't come from David Lapsley. That's from John Stewart. <laughs> David, uh, this is his stock question at every AGM, but uh, John Stewart this time. I, I was involved in uh, the installation of the pitch back okay. in 2013. And at the time the question was asked, what's the length of uh, the age that we can expect to get from the pitch and have it replaced. At that time, they didn't know because it was very much a new style pitch. Uh, they guessed eight years now. It's eight years now. But the pitch has just passed uh, a test again, uh, which we have to do every year. And uh, it probably will be good for another two years, another two seasons, this season coming and the one after it. We committed uh, back at least 18 months ago that we, we would do a review when the time was right. I've already spoken and had visits from the manufacturer and the contractor who fitted the pitch. Uh, they both agreed that it's still in good condition. Uh, I would argue that there were a lot of injuries on grass pitches last season as well. And a lot of our injuries came when we were playing in grass pitches. This is an old argument that's gone on for many years. And I can promise you that when we did an analysis about four years ago, uh, most of our injuries occurred, occurred on grass pitches because we were playing more on them. Uh, so I would argue that point out. But we are totally and utterly uh, committed to reviewing the pitch when the time is due to come up. But it's going to be, I would guess, uh, 2023 when we do that. And at that point, Ronnie, there's there's no preconceptions around it will definitely be artificial again. If it's more beneficial to go back to grass, that is a possibility. Yeah, we said we would review it. Everything will be taken into account. Okay, thank you. And the second question on infrastructure uh, was one for Phil and Kerry. Uh, it comes from Graham Ross, and he says, what plans do Phil and Kerry Rollins have for the club in the short term, infrastructure-wise, now that they are on the board? Well, I think, Lewis, um, I'm, I'm not quite sure what the question is referring to, but I think you've um, you've probably seen from um, the way we kicked off uh, this whole session with the with the, the work that we've completed so far, that we've actually done a tremendous amount uh, in infrastructure, um, and particularly infrastructure within the club, whether that be software, whether it be processes, whether it be um, systems that we put in place. So there's a lot of infrastructure investment that's already happened. There'll, there'll be more to happen. Um, and, and you'll see more of that over the coming months. I think if it refers to, uh, obviously I don't know what it does refer to, but if it, if it refers to, you know, developing the grounds around the stand, uh, we've said this before, um, Kerry and I are not developers. We didn't come into this uh, as developers to, uh, to develop land or develop, you know, uh, uh, land around the stadium. That's not, that's not our intent. It's not our agenda. Um, we're here to help develop and build Falkirk Football Club back up again to what we believe it can be. So we'll continue to invest in the infrastructure. There will be infrastructure on the pitch and, and around the around the club 
uh, to enable us to scale the club to where we believe we can get to. I'll add a bit to that, um, if, if I may. Um, the, 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 I have had um, a lot of discussions recently with the Falkirk Council. You, you all know that Falkirk Council are the um, uh, the owners of the stadium um, or the, or, and the ground round about, to Phil's point. Um, so uh, we, I, 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 the, the council are looking at what happens or what might be possible um, uh, to develop um, uh, around about the area. We know that that area of the Falkirk has, um, it is a priority area for investment. There's a lot of uh, 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 um, uh, plans for that at council level, and we are central to that. So there's a lot of discussions ongoing at the moment with council, um, uh, but that will take time because discussions with councils and these kind of areas always do. Okay. Uh, just before we move on to all aspects of uh, the first team and recruitment, we have somebody questioning uh, personnel and positions rather. Uh, so specifically, it's around the sporting director position and he's not questioning the person in the role, but they're questioning the role itself. So the question uh, comes from Alan Johnson. And he says, we are in the third tier of Scottish football for the first time in 40 years. How can we afford to employ any sporting director? And what does any person in that position do to justify that position and salary? I'll take that one, Lewis. I mean, it was one of the first things that when this new board came together last summer, it was one of the first priorities that we, we, we put on the table was that we need to improve the football infrastructure and we needed to improve a number of factors that meant the, the appointment of a sporting director or a, a director of football, whatever you want to call it, we call it a sporting director. It's first, first things to, to, to sort of cover off is this is not a unique phenomenon to, to Falkirk or, or to football. In fact, there are several clubs in, in League One and in League Two who have a sporting director and Obviously, Partick Thistle, who have, who have just gone out of the league, had a had a, a, a sporting director role there as well. So the question, I guess, is why did we decide it was the right route? Well, probably a number of reasons. Firstly, we needed that extra bit of football expertise to, to advise the board on our, our football strategy. The board, as you, as you see it now, has a, a number of areas of skills and expertise. And with the exception of Phil, none of us have worked in, in football before. So we needed someone who could advise the board and someone who's played at a high level, managed at a high level, coached at the, at the high level. And that was someone that when we recruited Gary, ticked all the boxes that we're, we're looking for. I get the point that people say it's a, it's a luxury in League One, but f for us, this board, our ambition needs to go beyond League One we can't continue to act like a League One club because if we do, we'll be here much longer than, than any of us want to want to be. So we need someone who can drive up standards off the park, but also give Paul the tools and the support to put a winning team on the park. So when you ask about well, what, is, what does Gary do to justify his salary, the, the question is, what does Gary not do at the club these days? He's, he's doing a, a hell of a lot of work. Um, he's, bring, he's brought back the youth development pipeline, and as Phil mentioned at, at the top of the at the top of the Q and A, we've, we've already trialled around sixty young footballers, and that's only going to increase over the summer with the support of Ian Fergus. We've improved the, the recruitment and the scouting part of, of the club. So I think if Falkirk fans can agree on anything, I think they can probably agree that over the past five or six years, our recruitment's been pretty poor, um, and that's something that we identified quite clearly as we needed to change. So. Spearheaded by Gary and also Liam Corr, we've, we've got a whole new recruitment and player profile system, and that's backed up by statistics and analysis, so to make sure that we make the right choices. And I'm sure Gary and Paul will be the first to admit that we're not going to get every single recruitment choice correct, but we're going to hopefully get more right than we get wrong, and that's going to give us the best possible chance of getting out of this league and hopefully out of the Championship and back into the, the Premier League. We need to move away from from a, a recruitment system that was really just relying on the views of one person. And we've had that in the past of it was a manager's choice that you wanted this player or that player. We need to make use of all the expertise. So whether that's Paul from Danny, Tony, Gary, everyone and Liam, Graham Henderson, everyone involved in the football side of the club has to have an input into the players that are coming in, not just from their football and ability, but also their, their personality. So we've got a really robust system in place now. Gary's also involved in, in working with Liam on opposition analysis and, and scouting. And we've also put into place, and I think Phil touched on this, a whole new suite around sports science, recovery, diet and nutrition. And Gary's been instrumental in terms of 
upscaling the equipment. So from it's the gym or trying to get ice baths or having canteen facilities at the club, really just upscaling everything off the park so that everything that's available to Paul and the players is as, as good as it possibly can be. And then the final couple of things he's been involved in is probably people have seen on social media that we've worked in a partnership with Napier University. So we had the, the players in uh, doing uh, pre-season testing with Napier. And that's something that we're, we're working with with universities around getting some interns on sports science, data analysis, physiotherapy, all upscaling the club uh, behind the scenes. And then the final point of what, what Gary does is taking some of the front of the knucklehead stuff off of Paul's plate. So dealing with agents, uh, contract negotiations, and really allowing Paul to focus on the training and the match day and getting the best out of the players. And one final comment, I don't want Gary's head to explode too much because I, I work with Gary on a, a near daily basis and, and speak to him most times. Genuinely, the guy puts in a power of work. I, I regularly get emails from him at one o'clock in the morning about things he's been thinking about or things he's been working about. So in terms of value for money for Gary, we are we are absolutely getting value for money for, for the work he puts in. So hope his head doesn't explode too much with that praise there. Yeah, we're, we're, we're almost damned if you do and damned if you don't. Because as I say, playing devil's advocate, if you didn't appoint a sporting director, director of football, whatever, whatever name you want to give it, you would have been criticised because it would have been, we have a board with no footballing experience trying to make footballing decisions. Whereas if you do appoint someone, regardless of who that person is, suddenly it's, why are we idling you know, middle layers of, of management in? So it was almost a, a, a no-win situation in a way. Yeah, absolutely. Colin, can I answer that for a second? I'm sorry. I I apologise. I didn't mean to cut across you. I think, Lewis, it was was an absolute necessity. If you'd seen the mess we're in, um, given things like contracts and everything else, Gary Holt is worth his weight in gold to us. Um, So it's an absolute win for this club to have Gary and Paul teaming together. Uh, And and we've got to look to the future of the game. The game's changing. It's, it's a much more sophisticated game than it was 10, 15 years ago. You can go right down the pyramid of football, whether it's in Scotland, England, the United States, Europe. It doesn't matter where you go. A model like the model that we've implemented is the model that clubs are implementing because the game has become so much bigger um, than it was 10, 15 years ago. You need the likes of a Gary Holt, whoever it may be, to, to help take this club forwards and to do the right thing so we don't end up back where we were in the same hole we're in. Sorry, Colin. No, that's exactly what what I was going to touch on as well. And the, the other criticism that could have came our way as well, that if we wanted to, to to bring a youth development structure back to the club, we need somebody to lead that. So if I had led it or Gary Deans had led it or Gordon Wright or Gordon Colburn had read it, people would have criticised and say, why have you got non-footballing people leading a footballing operation? So that's why we needed someone with with Gary Holt's pedigree to, to drive that forward along with all the other things that I, I mentioned before. Well, to finally get on to, to matters of football, um, Paul, I dare say you're, you're sitting there saying, what have I let myself in for? It's been a baptism of fire tonight with some of these questions in the background. And uh, Gary, of course, you've been involved in, in all this as well. Um, the Before we start uh, questioning you guys on first team matters, uh, perhaps one just for the board, but relating to the first team, uh, numerous fans have written in here uh, asking about budgets. So specifically, uh, can the board confirm that whether the budget for this year has increased, decreased, stayed the same? Um, and interestingly, how long can we uh, sustain ourselves as a club full time if we were to remain in League One? I think Gary Holt's view of the budget and my view of the budget might not be exactly the same. You can see him smiling. Um, we've given Gary pretty much um, ex- what he got last season. Um, I think one of the things I've learned about being on this board is that uh, you set the budget at the beginning of the season and then the whether it's the head coach or the director of football, he always comes back and asks for more. You know, It's like Oliver. It's like, can I have more? Can I have more? And you say... Sorry, there is no more. But the reality is this has, we've always given um, the most that the club can give. And uh, I I think we can reasonably say we've, well, we don't know about Queen's Park, but, you know, they they may well have a very, very big budget in the coming season. But but that's unusual. And I think we know the reasons for that. Um, 
we've almost certainly got the largest playing budget in this league by a considerable margin and probably bigger than many of the clubs in the championship. Um, that's, that's given us the ability to bring in the players that you've seen come in through the door in the last few months and, uh, and there are more to come. Um, so uh, pretty much, you know, we, we have not shirked from giving as much as we think we can possibly give. How long can we go on doing that? That's a really good question. Um, I, I, I Phil said earlier, I think this, this, this year, this season is going to be the, the, the really tough one financially. Um, and I think we all, we all recognise that. Um, I, I think a lot comes down to, you know, how, how loyal um, and supportive our, our sponsors, our advertisers and our fans are going to be. Um, they've been incredibly loyal for many years and the last couple of years have tested that loyalty to the absolute limit. And we know that. Um, but the longer, the longer we enjoy it, the longer we can ensure this club stays a full-time club. Um, I, I think, and this whole board believes that what we've got in place now um, on the park um, and the structure, the infrastructure we're putting in place off the park um, is going to lead to a much more successful season coming up. And I think if that happens, and, I, and we all believe it will, um, we won't be thinking about part-time football. Can I, can I just come in? And this will sound a little bit crystal ball gazing, but one of the things I think is going to happen, and, and, and for those of you who listen to, um, a, 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 not necessarily off the ball, but the, the BBC's football coverage on a Saturday afternoon and you read the, the, the back pages of the papers and so on, you'll see some of this starting to creep in or hear some of it starting to creep in. Um, going down the next few years, I think there's going to be a realignment within Scottish football. Um, it, not a realignment necessarily on reconstruction and so on, but some of the owners um, uh, um, are openly talking about um, a criteria to be able to get to the top league. Um, it, whether that be grass pitches to pick up on um, it, the questions earlier on or um, academy type structures or whatever. Um, but there's a, there's a push and Dave Cormack's been very, very open about that from Aberdeen's point of view. Um, it, but more and more are aligning along, along the same kind of themes. Um, it only only those clubs that reach certain criteria will be able to get to the top. Now, we might like that or dislike it, and we might argue against it. But I mean, if you look at how football, I think, is going in Scotland, we've got to be in that pack. We've got to be positioning Falkirk for the longer term um, to make sure that we are part of that pack. Um, we cannot afford, to Gordon's point, to fall behind. Um, um, and it will do our damnedest to make sure that we don't. But that's why we're talking about foundations, about investment, um, about putting those and building blocks in place to make sure that we can get back to where we should be, not just because we think that Falkirk is a Premier League club, but because we need to, to make sure that the long-term stability of Falkirk and the long-term viability of Falkirk is uppermost in everybody's minds. Perhaps the, uh, the kind of hot topic in terms of first team, uh, numerous fans were writing in. Dean Walker summarises it when he said, was there any type of inquiry into how the players resumed the season so poorly after the restart in March? For example, do you think it was a lack of fitness, a lack of leadership on the park? Was it coaching or was it something else? Do you want me to take that one? Yep, please go. Um, I, I disagree with you, Lewis, because we won the first game back. So that, that kind of puts that to bed. Um, I think there was mitigating factors. I think the short turnaround, I think the injuries to key players didn't help the management team uh, that we had. And I think that showed towards the end of the season. I think we had 13, 14 fit players going into the four games uh, at the end. So there was mitigating circumstances regarding it. Um, but I just think there was a whole, not making excuses for the COVID situation, the pandemic, um, but we were jumping through hoops to try and get games on um, and maybe th things off the pitch the, the strength conditioning sessions weren't allowed to be done you, had, you were single people in gyms you were you were structured against doing uh, the rehab and prehab sessions that you, you do on a regular basis um, so they that didn't help but the, the injuries to key players uh, at the crucial time of the season certainly impacted us massively. So that, that would probably I would go down um, as the main factor for us not continuing the, the work that went on before it. 
Okay. We have a, a couple of fans writing in with concerns uh, regarding training and fitness, basically. Uh, the first one uh, is a question from Jim Mills. Uh, and Jim says, last season, to me, the players looked unfit and part-time teams looked fitter than us in some cases. Will Paul or Gary be changing training methods because I think pace is essential in this league? Most teams sit in and the way to beat them, in his opinion, is down the wings. And he summarises by saying this is his 70th year following his beloved Falkirk, so please make it special. <laughs> I'll pass this one over to Paul. In terms of last season, I obviously can't comment on that, uh, Lewis. That, that's beyond me. And uh, In terms of this season, certainly uh, before me coming in, pre-season and everything was in place in terms of uh, the timings of things. So on that, between myself and, and Graham Henderson, uh, Danny now coming into that and Tony as well, we've worked hard to put a programme together to make sure that uh, fitness levels are good. Personally, I like to train at high intensity, so that fitness will come generally with the style of training that I have. Uh, Hendo, in terms of the closed season programme, looking at that was was excellent, and the work they've done over the closed season has already uh, bear fruit for them coming in. You can see every one of them is well conditioned. Uh, they've hit the ground running, and I've been... Uh, extremely impressed with the, the standard, the fitness of the players, the, their willingness to to work, the response to the the demands we've put on their training. So, uh, first impressions have been great. We understand that we, we need to get the balance, a, a rest and work, and make sure we get that right as the season develops. Because if it is a different intensity to what they're used to, we we'll have to make sure that they last throughout the season. So. We'll, we'll carry on to try and get that balance between us all as a staff and, and hopefully uh, come the end of the season that, that we'll all benefit from getting the programme right that we're building. What can you share, Paul, with the fans in terms of, of that training regime? And the reason I ask is Peter Moody made a very similar point. He was concerned about fitness against uh, part-time teams. He queried whether previously we were only training five hours a week, the same as a part-time team. Um, and he is, is wondering what your expectations are in terms of extra work by the players. So basic shooting, passing, crossing. He even asks if, you know, would a nine to five, four days a week approach be viable where her mornings are used for strength and conditioning and fitness and then the afternoon is more tactical? So can you even perhaps answer him by how would you see the, the training running? Nine to five is nigh on impossible, first and foremost, for, for professional athletes to work. And, and that's no making excuses. They kind of put that demands on their body. So uh, nine to five could work topping up with analysis and things totally but again you need to get the balance right of work and rest and uh, that rest is vital to players and I know people out with football tend to think they're pampered and what have you but uh, when you're in, in the thick of it and you're asking them to train uh, most days uh, it's important to, to get that balance and I continue to say that uh, in terms of how we work already there's, there's definitely double sessions and again I can't compare to last year because it's not my place to comment and I, I, and I wouldn't know what I was commenting on because I don't know how uh, that worked. But already they're in double sessions. Every day we've been in has been a double up to now. And I know it's pre-season and that will peter out a bit. But uh, more often than not, from the way me and my staff will work, they'll be in the building uh, certainly more double sessions and singles and that's that's a guarantee and, and whether that's a balance of tactical strength and conditioning, fitness, again, we'll, we'll strive to get that right. Lewis, it's, it, it's, I'll add a wee bit to it as well. It's, it's the culture we're trying to create and change. There's, there's very much, and I think even across society, it's, oh, you can't do this. COVID, can't do that, COVID. Now we're trying to change the culture now to, it's what can we do? So it's, it's trying to change that everyone's thinking that, well, if you can't do that, what can we do? How can we make it better? How can we get a, gym, a group gym session? How can we make it possible that we upscale everything uh, rather than having it as an excuse that, no, you can't do that. So it's everyone buying into that. It's the players buying into it from day one. It's the staff buying into it from day one. And they've been excellent, as, as Paul's touched on there, with the, 
the staff that's came in uh, underpinning what Paul's beliefs are with Danny and Tony. Um, but it's very much, it's a working environment. Lewis, that's what we're trying to, to set, that everyone associated with the club can see that the, the football side of it is part of the family uh, and aligned with everybody who works from Jacqueline in the office and Laura to Sharon to the ground staff to Keith the, uh, as well. Uh, and Ronnie, who's in most more days than not at the moment, um, can see that they're, they're coming to get their, they're earning their living they're not turning up as you said there five hours a week which is a myth um, and, and stupidity but the players earn the right to come and work for our club and, and they'll enjoy it while they're doing that I think uh, a, a lot of the pieces are around numerous aspects of recruitment from, from this point moving onwards Um Alan Smith writes in to say, Paul, first of all, uh, welcome to Falkirk. And uh, a key question that a lot of the fans have asked, and I think we touched on this in your uh, initial sort of signing interview, but some may have missed it. So have you been involved in the recruitment so far? Uh, a lot of the fans were saying, you know, a lot of the signings were rumoured before you were officially in position. Uh, are they your signings? Are they Gary's? Did you get final say? And uh, who gets the final say on recruitment? Can you guys explain to the fans how, how that works? Firstly, thanks, Alan, for welcoming me to the club. I uh, appreciate that. In terms of recruitment, uh, I think we've covered that already in terms of the player profile and things in the interview stage that was spoken about, and I was well aware of that. The player profile and suited the way I wanted to play, which obviously aligned with uh, the club bringing in a head coach to suit that player profile, which makes total sense. And uh, if they didn't do that, it'd be pointless setting up that player profile, uh, profiling, sorry. So that was in place. There was pre-contracts in place. They had to be in place or the club would have been left behind. Um, so Gary's done a brilliant job in that since I've came into the club. I've, uh, Marcel, Gary, Liam, uh, Danny, Tony's came into that now as well. Are constantly looking at players between all of us. Does the player suit the club? Have we got an opportunity to get in that player? So it's very much a joint effort. Uh, but I think now that there is a head coach in place, that final say has to come from me. Uh, and if it's a player that we don't think will fit the profile, then it won't suit at all. So it has to come under that profile. It has to be a joint effort. And everybody, again, as Gary spoke about, buying into what we want to do for the club. We're all a part of that. Everyone is a part of that. And it's important we all play a part in that. Gary, perhaps one for you. Uh, Ross Bailey writes in uh, with a query around the, the effectiveness of the previous recruitment in January. Um, he says, my question relates to the signing policy in the last window, please. Uh, I was concerned at the, at the time about the amount of inexperienced young players coming in to, quote, fill out the squad, as the previous management team called it. The quality in the pitch before the break was not particularly great, and I feel emphasis should have been more so on trying to wheel and deal to bring in better quality for the first team rather than quantity. Uh, he feels that Partick's signings made the difference, uh, such as Scott Tiffany, and he believes that that misjudgment perhaps cost us. Can you shed any light on why the approach was ultimately decided on? Um, and, you know, was everyone in the hierarchy happy with what they were seeing on the pitch? Because he says he wasn't confident about the squad winning the league, despite being top at Christmas. Um, there's a couple of things there, Lewis, to, to cover on. Um, we had 26, maybe 27 players signed at the end of the transfer window. Uh, and, uh, well, obviously 23, and um, we looked at the group, spoke to the management, um, felt that we needed some more legs within the squad, hence the fact that we went for the younger players to come in and bolster the squad. Um, Scott Tiffany, as you said, is a young boy as well. He's 22, maybe, if that. Um, so I think also you look at it, when you've got a squad of 23 already or 24 already signed, you kind of just keep going signing players loose. You have to look at what, what you need, what needs to, to be added. Um, so we felt that you go down the route of giving the younger ones with their legs and energy to come in and bolster the squad. And to be honest, Lewis, if we hadn't went and got them boys, we would have struggled even more so because Kai Foreman played over 75% of our games. Lewis Nielsen is an exceptional talent. 
Um, Kyle McClellan's a good player as well. So it wasn't it wasn't duds. It wasn't young boys that we were um, just taking a gamble on. There were players that were put through the profile in, as Paul's already touched on. As I said before, though, the injuries to the key players, the experience within the group, is what hampered us. Paul Dixon, Ben Hall, Charlie Telfer, um, at the time when we were on top of our game. So you went from playing Clyde and beating them with them three in the team and Charlie scoring a goal to going to Cove the next week and they three were missing. So it's a massive ask for anyone to come in and, and change that. Um, totally happy with the recruitment we've done. As I said, in the transfer window, we were 27 signed players fit. You go into the last four games of the season, you've got 14. So it's a, it has a massive impact in, on, on any squad. Um, with hindsight, which should we have my experience? No. I, I think we had a very experienced group, hence the fact that you look at the recruitment we've done this year is to bring the age bracket down. More hungrier, fitter. Um, lots of energy to give Paul the best opportunity to, to go and be successful this year. We've had one question from Marshall Fleming. He's uh, a bit concerned about things that have happened in the past. And I think his key point here is he's trying to see how can we learn from it. His question is, in the past few seasons, we've heard the same statements from previous boards and managers that they are building a team of quality players to play attacking football and to win the league. But unfortunately, what we've ended up with was a poorer quality player who unfortunately struggled at League One level uh, and against some of the part-time teams and couldn't put the ball in the net. What changes will we be making as a club uh, and how can we assure the fans that history will not repeat itself again because he wants to dominate the league, I'm sure, as we as we all do? Well, I'll, I'll take it first and then Paul can go into talking about the tactical side of the game and then and how he's going to approach games. But I think you look at the recruitment we've done um, as a club, the contracts we've offered to the players coming in, the age brackets that we're looking at, the quality of players at the levels they've played at, um, and they're hungry they want to achieve they're winners they want to win things um, so that's that's with the board's backing and Gordon Coburn's right I do ask him for more every single day and he probably hates me asking him but that's that's the life of my job and, and I'll continue to do that because I want to get, keep giving Paul the best that we've got um, so in that aspect I think that's massively different to what's been going on Phil touched on it the contracts that were given out before and the players that we had, the scattered on approach almost to, to certain individuals coming in and being part of the club. Um, we're trying to build the stability. It is going to take time. The, the club have backed up with the five-year plan that has been openly spoken about. Um, and they have given us the tools to go and recruit these players to, to get them in longer-term contracts, to build something. Um, we know it's a season when we all want to win the league. None more so than me, but you've also got to understand that you, you, there's processes in, being put in place and the infrastructure being put in place to get to that stage. And that's what we're trying to do with the, the recruitment that we've done, with the staffing that's been put in place, with the development side that's it's slowly but surely taking shape um, to give this club the best footing going forward. Out of respect and how we're going to play and how we're going to win in games, that's that's posed to me. Paul, uh, there's one uh, question from Alan here. Uh, do you have a squad size in mind? Yeah, similar to what Gary speaks about. There, there has to be a cap somewhere in terms of how you look at your budget. I think uh, we're up to 16 now. Obviously, just one goalkeeper, so we need to uh, get another goalkeeper in. Uh, that's uh, a given, so that'll take us to 17. We we'll probably spoke about myself and Gary. If we could get 18 signed players, and then maybe start dipping into the loan market and see what we can get there. Uh, with another maybe three or four, if that's possible, uh, and, and if they're the right type. So that was the initial aim, and, and we're well on on uh, target for achieving that, which is important. And it's it's uh, again testament to Gary that we're that we're up to sixteen already. When when I think uh, a first came across the job, there was only five players signed, so, so we've done a brilliant job in, in getting onto that and getting onto that quickly. And obviously the, 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 the quality player we've brought in, I think it's important for the club that they are young, they are in, uh, energetic, enthusiastic and want to be better, which is vital and, and certainly in, uh, 
like I say, first impressions, every one of them are, are looking to impress. And up until now, they've done that. And you want them to be hungry. You want them to, to better themselves as quickly as they can. And whether that's here or moving on elsewhere and becoming sellable assets for a club like Falkirk, that's vital as well. And without the academy at the moment, it becomes even more important to get the types of players uh, in at the club. So I think we've done a brilliant job of that. And, and hopefully, again, as the season develops, we will get a brand of football that suits the player profile, that, that suits the club, and ultimately pleases the fans because we're no daft, but we know it's important that, that they come and they enjoy their football and that that's the aim. Doesn't always work. I'm, I'm not naive enough to say that we're just going to hit the ground running and we're going to run away with a league which will be super competitive. It always has been and I think the club's found that in their previous two seasons in the league. So uh, we will do all we can as a staff to to bring that brand of football and uh, God willing that, that we'll manage that. Interestingly, you mentioned... Part- yeah, two sentences gone, uh, uh, call, uh, Lewis Gordon. That's 22 players he said signed, not 18. Okay. Do you get, do you get the other four for free? Is that what happens? <laughs> <laughs> Well, interesting, you said so there was 18 signed and potentially you said three, possibly four loan signings, Paul. Uh, Lewis McKenzie wrote in to say, would we be using the loan market a bit more effectively this year? Uh, He didn't think that all the loan signings worked out last year. Uh, We we didn't think the quality was as good, whereas he felt Montrose, as the example he he gives, uh, he says they used it to great effect uh, with Cami Ballantyne and Mokery, who made a real impact. So from what you were saying a minute ago, safe to say you're actively looking to, to use the loan market. Yeah, I think at our level you have to. You have to buy into that. And, and on loans, it, it can be a gamble at times. We've been involved in development football for the, fa- uh, the past few years. It's uh, noticeable that some boys you think are ready for loans and go and it doesn't quite happen. You look at some players and you think they're more than ready to, to come in and make an impact and it, it doesn't. Prime example for me, Scott McKenna had, had two loans away from Aberdeen, uh, struggled on both loans, uh, came back, and ended up playing a game for the 21s and was outstanding and, and never looked back from there. So it doesn't always work out loans and it's, it is a bit of a gamble at times. But again, as a staff, we'll do all we can to, to make sure it's the right types. Liam's constantly on the lookout, constantly throwing clips at you, at different players. And uh, I think the important thing is, is to try and get ones that have played games. And again, the recruitment already suggesting that the players were brought in or played a lot of football, albeit the young players have still played a lot of football. So it's trying to get that balance, uh, hoping that they've played football at some level, but there's the odd one that you may think that is just worth that punt and uh, they'll either sink or swim. It's, it's sometimes a gamble in that loan market that you have to take. We have a, an interesting recruitment one, but this one is uh, directed at, at you, Phil. Um Alan writes in to say, I, like most people, was absolutely delighted when the Rollins investment involvement was announced. Uh, To date, though, I can't really see a huge benefit to the club from the investment, specifically with regards to the quality of players that we're signing. Uh, When can we see some better quality players? But I'm not entirely sure you would expect to be actively involved in recruitment, Phil. Is that safe to say? Um, Lewis, I'm I'm, I'm pretty persuasive, but I... I don't think even I could get Lionel Messi to come and play in the Seaside League. Um, so, you know, it's that's a little bit beyond my, my, my pay grade. Uh, what I've been focused on is, if you like, bringing the expertise and the experience I've gained over 20-odd years with, with Stoke and Orlando uh, and working alongside Gary to, to ensure that we have the right infrastructure in place that the poor can take advantage of. Um, I think if you ask me as a as a fan, which is what I am at the end of the day. If you ask me as a fan, I think I'm excited about the fact we've got, I think, a great blend of, of experience and youth. You know, the Brad Mackay and Stephen Hetherington are experienced professionals have played at a higher level. And, and we've surrounded that with, you know, the likes of Leon McCann and Ryan Williamson, Aidan Nesbitt, Craig McGuffey, exciting young players, you know. So it, it, I, I'm, I'm genuinely excited about the coming year. And I know the play, the way Paul wants to play. Um, you know, because we we had extensive interviews with him. Um, so I'll let them speak about the, the quality of the players they've had in for the last week. But 
I'm, I'm excited about who we've got in the building and, and, and how we'll play, you know, the style of play we'll have in the coming season. Can I can I chip in a wee bit here? Because what, what, I'm, I'm the only one probably that's tainted or part of um, uh, the, 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 the recruitment before all the new board members came on board and certainly before Paul and Gary. And, and I, 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 we talked earlier on about not throwing people under buses and all the rest of it. And I, don't, I, I genuinely don't want to do that. But the contrast between the, the recruitment process now um, and the, the first recruitment process that I saw is night and day, absolutely night and day. Um, the first one I saw, I was scared. This one, um, I'm very hopeful that we've got it right. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a Falkirk fan, so I never be confident, um, but I'm, I'm hopeful that we've got it right. Um, and certainly in terms of process, in terms of thought, um, um, in terms of analysis, it's miles better, miles better. Okay. We have a question on a specific player from Gary Seaton. Uh, he says, while it may not be popular, has the club management considered signing a proven goal scorer in League One, such as David Goodwilly, to get us out of this league? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, yes, we have, um, a, um, a, and specifically on the name that was that, that's mentioned, we we have um, a, um, a thought about that. And the answer, it's the actually, it's the only. The only signing or the only consideration that the board have given um, to not signing someone um, for, for, for reasons that people will understand, might not agree with, um, but the board said, no, we're not going there. Um, and that's the only time that the board have intervened in a signing. Um, it, um, and the board were very strong as to why. Um, it, everybody will have their own opinions um, on David Goodwillie, who's a great football player, but it did not make sense for us as a community-based club um, to go down that road. Um, it, so that's the only one. Now, um, I'll let Gary and Paul um, answer on um, their, their, their plans to sign a 20-goal striker because I've heard them speaking about that in the last last week or so. Well, Lewis, I've got a, I've done a fair bit of background on it. Okay, and I'll, I'll not bore you with... Well, I might bore you with all the details. In the last three seasons, across the four leagues, okay, all four leagues of Scottish football, there's only been 21 players who have scored 15 or more league goals. Please don't ask me to name them all. No, but like three, of the, three, three of them have been. I've done it more than once. So there's 18 players, right? Okay. Now, this is the thing, and it's, it's it's trying to make aware. In the last season alone, there was only one player across four, four leagues scored more than 15 league goals. Okay. That was that was Edward. Now, I'd love to say we could get him, but I don't think he'll come. Like Messi. And then you look at the names. You've got Morelos. Cosgrove, Shankland, Stephen Dobie, Billy Mackay, Lawrence Shankland, Nisbet, uh, John Baird, Meganson. So it's the it's the thing that we're trying the damnedest to find um, to give Paul the best opportunity. Um, but it just shows you that of them ones that I've named, you ain't going to get them. You ain't going to get them. We've thrown one hat into the ring for certain players and spoke to agents regarding um, players who have done well in the in the championship who have moved. Um, but it's the one that we are, as every club's try to look for, is that 15-goal striker that we haven't had for a spell and we haven't had a lot of in the last few years. So it just shows you over the four leagues in the last three seasons, there's been 18 players. And you can discount 10 of them straight off the bat. Or 40-odd clubs. Yeah. Yes. So it's um, it's the hardest thing to get. It's the hardest thing, thing to find. Um, but it does show the work that we are trying to do. That we're not just pie in the sky, picking names at a heart. We're, we are looking a lot of diligence about these players. Um, and then it's also, you find some, are they a one-hit wonder? Have they done it over a period of time? Or is it just that one-off season? So it's um, something that no stone has been left unturned, Lewis, to be honest, try to find. Um, and hopefully we we can get one. Hopefully we can find somebody. But also I think within the group we've got, that Paul's got with the coaching that Paul and Danny and Tony are putting into them, I believe that we've got goals in the building as well. Paul, uh, we have Alan writing in to say, have you selected a team captain yet? And if so, who? Because... Obviously, you can have both club captain and team captain. What's your thoughts on that? 
Uh, haven't yet is the, the short answer. There's, there's no decision being made on that. Uh, we're obviously in the infancy of getting to know the squad. Uh, we'll do all we can to get the right person in. We're constantly looking at the players, not only as footballers, but as characters as well. And, and we know the importance of getting that one person right. Ultimately, you, you want them all to play their part anyway. So if we can bring a togetherness within the squad, you're hoping that there's uh, certainly five or six of them that will drag people through. But in terms of an individual, we're yet to make that decision. We'll wait until games start. Uh, and we're in no rush to do that. We're in no rush whatsoever to do that. But it's, it's certainly on our mind uh, and it's something we'll deal with going forward. And the, uh, the final two questions, again, they're on first team. Uh, so uh, Alan asked, the squad requires further recruitment at the moment based on numbers. Uh, in which areas do you feel we require improvement? Well, I think already we spoke about the striker. I think that's vital. But again, uh, when I spoke to the players before I came in, pre-training, I've told them, every one of them, to make sure they make an impression on me. Uh, and up until now they're doing that. Every one of them's uh, attitude towards training has been outstanding. So the more they do that, the more opportunity they're giving themselves, the players that are in the building already, and uh, they have to continue to impress and take their opportunity of a fresh start. So uh, in terms of strikers, you, you've got Anton, uh, Aidan Keener, uh, and then right across that front line, you've, you've got Ability and Callum Morrison, McGuffey, Nesbitt, screaming out of ability at the top end of the pitch. So right away, they all have to do their part and chip in and make sure that they are scoring goals when they get that opportunity. And like Gary says, we're doing all we can, all we can to find the right one. And it's it's going to be difficult. And all we can hope for is that we unearth a gem from somewhere and we'll continue to try and do that. It's a constant for us at the minute. Defensively, we, we probably need a wee bit more cover, whether that's a centre-back stroke full-back to allow us the grace in both positions. I mean, your squad's a little tighter. It's important you get day types of players in the team as well that, that they can cover maybe one, two, three positions is, would be even better. But if they can cover, certainly, centre-back full-back, it gives you a wee bit grace in terms of other areas of the pitch. So they, for me, are two main ones. And I spoke earlier, obviously, that the goalkeeper is vital as well to come and put pressure on Robbie uh, as soon as we can get that one right. The thing is, as well, Lewis, is without giving too much away, we've, we've got a fair fair amount of boys in trialing as well. Okay. To give themselves the best opportunity to showcase to them to the to Paul what they're about. Uh, so there is two goalkeepers in. There is six, five or six outfield players. So they're all they're, there's a fair amount of training. It's not just the bare sixteen. So there's there's scope there that we we have a good group for for Paul. Um, and to be fair, I think. Even the trialists are trying their best to impress, and that's that's a good thing. We've not had any that turned up or not turned up after a day. Think this is too hard. They've all bought into how Paul's training methods are um, and given themselves the best opportunity to try and earn the contract. Based on those numbers, Gary, you mentioned a couple of goalkeepers and five or six outfielders. I I know you won't give us names. Don't worry, um, but. Can you tell the fans in the next week or two, can they expect to see any new signings? Seb Ross signed yesterday, I think. That's now official, that one, yep. Um, no, Lewis, I'm not getting you anything. Oh, something. You're just, you're just no. like a... Oh, man, OK. Well, in that case, the final question of the night is uh, from Alan Smith. Uh, and Paul, he says, we now have a few wingers at the club. Does your style of football allow for two wingers on the park at the same time? Uh, yes. Again, as a short answer to that, uh, definitely. I like to play a, a 4-3-3 as flexible as that can be and look. So I do like three up top. And that more often than not looks like two wide players. I get that you'll play certain teams and you'll have to adjust, but uh, again, it comes under the player profile and it's pointless bringing new players to the club and, and no having scope to play them. So there's a purpose for it all. We're not just, again, throwing players into the mix and uh, they won't play because they're wide players. There's a process that we're going through and part of that process is they fit the style of play that we want to implement and 
uh, they'll be a huge part of our style of play. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for to, to all of you. Um, I'll just take a minute to, to say thanks because I appreciate some of the questions were, were not the easiest to answer uh, or hear. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm sure the fans will appreciate the, the kind of clarity that's been given on a whole range of topics here tonight. Um, the other thing I would say is at some point, as and when we're allowed to, you know, to get people back in a room together, um, would there be an appetite to, to do this again? Yeah, but, but, but Lewis, I mean, you're, you're kind of stealing my thunder because I was I, I was going to do a, a wee wrap up, and 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 firstly, um, again, as I started, um, uh, uh, as we started this night, I'd like to thank you um, for for putting yourself in this position, fielding all these questions, putting them across as openly and as bluntly and and, and as challengingly as you have. That's that's what we wanted. Um, uh, um, so that this that that's great. Um, uh, I'd like to thank everybody else in the call. Um, uh, um, uh, for all the work that they've done supporting the club, supporting me, um, uh, um, uh, which has been fantastic. Um, uh, we, 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 the, the amount of work that's been going on over the last few months um, has been tremendous. Um, uh, um, and people really step them up um, uh, to put in place what we need to be able to put in place, everything we've talked about tonight. tonight. So it's been absolutely fantastic. And I'd like to thank those who are on the call and everybody back at the club that we've not mentioned. Um, and we've missed some names. and I'm not going to go over them. Um, uh, everybody has been working their butt off, to use that phrase. It's, it's been fantastic. Um, going back to your, your question there, yeah, absolutely. We will have a live event. Um, uh, um, we all want to get back. Um, uh, we're not hiding, um, uh, 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 as we said at the start, um, uh, um, and we want to get these questions. Colin meant, uh, uh, summed up well. We need to get better at communication. We know that. Um, uh, we've got excellent channels in which we can use, club channels at which we can use to inform people, to get people uh, a wee bit more knowledge about what we're doing in the development squad, for example, just to take one, one aspect of that. So there's lots of exciting things going on, and we will um, be looking at what should we do, what, what should we be doing, and how do we improve that um, uh, going forward? So again, thank you, um, uh, and thanks to everybody um, uh, for their questions, and keep them coming. And I guess that just leaves the, uh, the final thing for myself is simply to say to, to each and every one of you, thanks for your time.